You are watching Call for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois. It's Friday, March 19th, 18th, March 18th, 2022, at around 11 p.m. Today, we're going to play Hidden Games Crime, Crime Scene Case 2, which is known as the Midnight Crown in the American uh, vocalized version. And we'll talk a little bit. I've got on the left the case one, which we're skipping over. We're jumping right to case two because case two has no presence on BGG, no videos, no nothing. We know nothing about it. Case one seems to be fairly uh, well regarded. Um, but we're going to start with case two, and if this goes well, we'll circle back to case one next week, presumably. If you could let me know in the channel, if you can hear me and see me okay. All right, let's go over our itinerary for tonight. We're going to do a full playthrough of this game, the way we do most of these live streams. It could take us three hours, six hours, seven hours, etc. I believe we'll be able to get it done in one session, which we could go up to eight hours, but I don't think it'll take us that long. We will play the full thing. We will read everything. I will try to show everything, all the documents, very close up so you can take screenshots of them if you want to follow along and refer back to them. So you might get yourself ready to take screenshots if that's important to you. Um, and then after we finish playing it, we will spend some time discussing it and put it in context of the other games of, in its genre, which I've been calling the mystery suspect cold case document genre. Um, okay. So this will be full of spoilers. If you want to play this game yourself, you should... Uh, tur turn off the channel when we start playing it, which will be in a couple of minutes, and you can come back and watch it um, after you've played it to see how we did. But this is, uh, you can only play these games once, so you shouldn't watch this stream if you plan to play this on your own. What else do we need to say? I do think that um, I should probably be giving a little bit of caveats when we play these games kinds of mystery games, a stronger warning. And that is that all board games are subjective, obviously, whether you're going to like them or not. And you can get some feel for the quality of a game by watching reviews and listening to people whose tastes are similar to yours. But I think, especially with these mystery games that you only play once that are heavily sort of story dependent, dependent on you getting in the same wavelength as the designer and where we come into these things with different uh, desires for difficulty level. Some of us want very hard, some of them want very easy. So, and these games, you don't adjust it. You just get what you get. So that's all a way of saying that you should take with a real grain of salt um, my impressions, my reviews of these games. You may have a completely different take uh, depending on the difficulty level you want, depending on whether you care more about story or mystery, etc. cetera. And um, in the channel with me is Jonathan Warner as normal, but also we've got a couple more friends with us today. Duke of Zill and Robert are both back. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this series and this company, Hidden Games, because you can see from the chat, Duke of Zill saying he owns the first case, but the Australian version called the Baradale case. So let's take a look at this for a second. Let's look at this first case, which I, it's 2019, 2020, somewhere around there. They're fairly recent. Okay. Uh, Hidden Games is a German company. And they produce a bunch of these mystery type games. They've got, I think, about six cases, six of these. Only two have been localized for America and the UK. 
here they are. But it looks like the others may come eventually, and then they've got some some games that are similar but not identical to this. They've got a sort of advent calendar postcard puzzle game, mystery game that looks quite cool. 24 envelopes or so, and you, you have to figure out what order to open them. But this series, The Crime Scene, about six of these in German, and two have made it to English. One of the really odd things, and maybe what's taking them so long to localize them, is they did a little bit... I forget if Fire, Fire and Adwerstein did this too. Um, is there, They localized it for a location. So in America, it's the New Haven case. And in every different country, it's a different location. And I, I'm gathering they're going to localize the contents in some way, the newspapers, if there are any, etc. It seems like an awful lot of work to go through. And I would be just as happy playing the game in Germany, set in Germany, as long as it doesn't require anything. So it is a little, it is a little unusual. Um, so a couple more interesting things about this um, series. First of all, you should know, if you love board games, the Germans are, they're the country for board games. They, that country has embraced board games more than any other. And frequently, these, the best of these detective mystery games seem to originate in Germany. Then Sherlock Holmes are sort of originate in, in France. It's interesting how the different countries specialize. But, um... One interesting thing here is that there are no authors listed, no writers. And it's a little unusual. When we played the adventure series, Fire and Adwerstein and Still Lake, Kaifeng 982, and one more that's escaping my mind at the moment, the American versions also didn't list authors. And I don't know why. I think of all board games... These mystery type games should have the authors listed. This is like writing a story. So I'm a, it's a little interesting. Murder in Antar Death in Antarctica, Jonathan says, was the name of the other one I'm forgetting. Yes, I shouldn't forget that. That's one of my favorites. Okay. The other thing is, so I think the adventure series, which I'm on record as thinking that that's the best series, the best, the highest quality, most engrossing, fully fleshed out, most polished series, best answers, whatever. You can watch my review of the four games in the adventure series, a spoiler free review. And you can watch a couple of videos I've done reviewing other uh, mystery suspect games like this. Some that are good, some that are not so good. And when we finish playing both of these, I'll try to make a spoiler-free review of both of them. So you can watch that if you don't want to watch this live playthrough. Now, what's particularly interesting about uh, us playing this now is that we've spent the last six weeks or so, Jonathan Warner and I, and, and also Duke of Zill and Robert have joined us for some of it. We spent the last six weeks, two months playing the games that gave birth to this genre from the 1930s, there were books, crime dossiers is what they're called, and they were books of, little, of evidence and documents. And you read through it in sequence. It tells a story like a novel, but you're also trying to figure out what happened. So it's going to be fascinating for us to now jump way back completely to the modern age. Now we're jumping from the 30s right up until 2020 or so. And these are examples of modern games. There's going to be some use of the internet in this game. And I haven't opened these, but I can see there's some little gimmicky thing with using your mobile phone and getting a phone call, which we'll talk about. So, but we've jumped from 30s to 2020, and now we're going to see what a modern game looks like. And if it if it holds up, how we feel about these now that we've seen the older ones. So probably at the end, we'll do some talking about the difference in feel from a modern game and the old games. All right, so I'm going to put aside case number one. We'll open and play that possibly next week. 
and let's take a look at case number two. Before we do, should we should we catch up on the chat? Is there anything you guys want to say? Any updates in your life? Anything we should talk about? I believe they're identical cases, except for the localization features. I don't think there's anything other, uh, anything else different. Um, it's an active company. Uh, if you go on their website, maybe we'll take a look at it. You can see they've localized it into a dozen different languages. It looks like maybe the, uh, it's well thought out so that if you're hearing impaired, you can read uh, summaries of the audio that you would otherwise listen to, etc. So it does look like a, 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 a polished, well-designed system, but we'll see how well that holds up. Jonathan says he didn't get to the hitcher yet. We should say we have no idea what to expect with this game, how difficult it will be, how good the quality is. We just don't know. All right, let's take a look at this here. So uh, you can see it's, it's framed as if we're getting this package in the mail, sent to Holmes and Partner in New York. Candy Maker Street. If that's a street in New York City, I don't know it. Um, okay, and it says, examine the evidence, review witness statements. So there's going to be some audio for us to listen to, and then research online on the web. And this one actually has a little bit of an awkward thing at the back. Let's take a look at it. It says, do not open until you've entered your data online. Oops. Do not open until you've entered your da data online. Please carefully read the instructions below first. So this is sent by Inspector Jason Mahoney in New Haven. It's interesting, he's sending it from the location of the other one. All right, it doesn't want us to open it until we've gone online and done this. Now I did this already because I wanted to make sure nothing would interfere with us. Okay, the theft of a famous piece of jewelry creates a true mystery. Why did the perpetrators leave something behind? Can you reveal their scheme and solve the case? Okay, it says, in this game, you get to be real detectives. You will work together as a team to carefully examine all of the documents, search for evidence, validate alibis, and find creative solutions. Use all of the tools at your disposal, even your smartphones. Your mission. Where will the secret meeting take place? Who is the secret client? What is the mystery behind the item found in the display case? Who stole the Midnight Crown? Now look what it says here. Before you get started, visit the page at Hidden Game CSI. Select Case 2. Enter your phone number and validation code below. Your phone number is very important, but will only be used for the game. Only then can the investigation begin. Please do not open the envelope before this point. So we're going to um, do that now together. And then it says to start, start the, now the first case doesn't have this, I believe. First case doesn't use your phone, but this case does. And you can see the trouble they went through to localize. That means every country that they sell this in, they have to have a phone call get made to your phone. Okay. To start the game, study all the documents, hang up the poster. We'll just be spreading it out on the table. Take notes. Every player should read all the documents. When you finished, enter your solution online and listen to the finale. So some multimedia in this game. It's listed as 1.5 to 2.5 hours. If we do the normal, what we do on this channel, multiplied by three, that could be a seven hour case. All right, so we're gonna follow the rules. Before we open it, we're gonna visit this webpage. I'm gonna put in, I've got my phone with me here. So we're gonna put in that's my cat there, Sarah. We're going to put in the information and we're going to see if it will, how we're going to need the phone. All right, so let's go over here to, and there's the BGG page on it. All right, so we're going to go to the website here. So here's the Hidden Games website. 
you can see this is the English version. So the English ver version, they're coming soon with their third case. And then this is this advent calendar mystery thing that looks pretty good. Uh, but they've got a whole bunch of other cases in Germany. All right, so for now, we can pick one of these two cases. We're going to pick case two. All right, the Midnight Crown. Let's see what it says. Okay, it wants us to make sure we're playing English, American, which we are. Okay. Before you start to play, in order to make the criminal case as realistic as possible, it's necessary that you enter your real telephone number. The phone must be switched on and loud during the game. So I'm going to turn on my phone here and unlock it. Okay, and I'm going to turn off Do Not Disturb. Okay. All right, so it's on. We should be able to hear it if anything calls us. All right, enter your real phone number. Data will only be used to communicate within the framework of the game. Please also give the validation code, which is on the box. Okay, for deaf players, you can find additional information below if you click go directly to hint. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this here for a second. You can enter your phone number, in which case it's going to call you at some point. Or if you don't have, a, if you don't want to deal with the phone, this is a nice, then you can basically click this and listen to the intro, which is what this phone call is going to be. But then what it tells you here is, I'm going to, I'm going to give this a little spoiler. This is the only thing. Be All right, so we're going to start playing. So if you don't want spoilers, time to close the channel. Okay. Duke of Zill says, maybe the criminal will call you mid-case. Well, it does say that he's going to, that some that you're going to get a call in 15 minutes if you don't use your phone. Okay, so I only mention that because we're going to, do it a little weird. We're not going to start playing right away because we're going to want to scan the documents and then maybe take a break. So I think I may have to resubmit my phone call when we want to start the 50 minute clock. I'm afraid, I don't know, but what I'm afraid is it's going to give you some hints after 50 minutes. And I don't want it to give us those hints early or anything. And I don't know if other stuff's going to happen. So I'm going to put in my phone number here that where you can't see. Hopefully you can't see this. All right. Okay, it says I said the name wrong. Okay. All right. Okay. So I've put in my phone number and okay, so there's a call. So I'm gonna try to listen to this with you. If we don't, we can listen to it online. Hello, this is Inspector Jason Mahoney from the New Haven Police Department. Please put me on speaker so that everyone can listen in. Hello, everybody. You might remember me. I am a policeman at the local department, and right now I'm investigating a tricky case that was handed over to us by Great Falls. It's all about a stolen crown of inestimable value. Since you did such a great job helping us out with the last investigation, and I'm not making any headway, I thought I might contact you about this case, too. We've already done some work at New Haven Police, of course. I'm sending you an envelope with all the information I have that might be relevant to the case. You can use it as the basis for your investigation. One more thing. Please make sure you leave this phone turned on, and keep the ringer turned on as well. I'll call you back after I leave my office. Good luck. Okay, good. So I didn't spoil anything. He's told us he's going to call us back after he leaves his office. So my only concern is that he's going to give us hints in 50, in 50 minutes, is what the website suggests. And I, I don't want it to happen too early. But he's told us that he's going to call us back. All right, we'll see. We'll, we'll listen to it. If we feel like it's premature, I'll just hang up and enter the phone number again, and we'll get it. 50 minutes from then. All right, here we go. Let's open this up. So what did he say? I wasn't really paying attention. He just said it's a difficult case. Uh, he sent us an envelope. 
right? Let me know if I missed anything in the in the chat that was important. That's a part of the problem with playing these online is sometimes I'm focused on what I'm saying and not listening or not paying attention. All right, let's see what we've got here. And let's, this is one of the things we like looking at when it's nice to look at different companies, how, how they have a, their own little twists on this and if they do anything differently. So let's see how they do something differently. All right, so this is already kind of different. We've got um, a little starting sheet here. It looks like a folder. It's got four questions. Examine all evidence smartphones are allowed for tips in the finale. Go to their website. And here's the contents. Investigation poster, photo, sealed envelope, transit map. Okay. If you're missing any documents or if you wrote on a document and want to print a new copy, you can download individual copies here. Okay. Let's see what we got. Oh, okay. So here we got, we've got, looks like, the authors of this game. This would be the time to take your screenshots. Should we be taking a break first, a five minute break? No, we're gonna do the screenshots, then we'll take a break. Okay, so look, here are some people in this company. I know Reek, Rick, is the woman who founded this company, I believe. Okay. All right, let's continue here. Let's, let's look at all the documents so you can scan them. And it says, it, they, they don't come in any specific order here. We're allowed to look at them all. So I'm just gonna go through them all, let you scan them, and then we'll go back and read them. Okay, it's double-sided. Remember, don't worry about trying to make sense of these yet. This is just for you to take screenshots if you want to play along and do this with us. Interesting. It feels quite modern. All the documents we're looking at mainly look like they're almost computer screenshots. Got some fingerprints. Got a whole bunch of little stuff here. Photographs. Great Falls Public Transit Map. A sealed envelope. Open, only open this envelope after you've been specifically instructed to do so. Okay. Another map. Great Falls City Guide. A newspaper, a local newspaper. A little sex 
seal there. Okay, a little sheet for taking notes, suspect motive evidence and notes. We'll just put this aside. And then something interesting that this game has added, which I think should be in all of these games, and although I think they should give you individual cards, but look, it looks like they've laid out the suspects for you. So you can keep notes and make a little mind map. Okay, so that's all the documents. We've briefly gone through them, and now we'll start the game proper. Well, first, we'll take a little five-minute break, then we'll come back and start the game. Maybe I'll resubmit my phone number so that we can reset the timer, possibly. But I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Call for Two. We are playing Hidden Games Crime Scene Case Two: The Midnight Crown. We are just starting. We got a phone call from a detective who said they sent us this case to solve. I tried to reset the timer by submitting my phone number again. It didn't work. It didn't call me back again. So I'm hoping I haven't messed up the phone call. If within the next 50 minutes we don't get another phone call, we'll have to look, listen to it manually. Um, Robert asks, uh, Robert says, Jesse, I like the bumper music. Can you tell me more about the music and how it came to be on your channel? Okay, I'm going to tell you a quick little story, and then I'll tell you the answer to that. Um, in the beginning of the channel, the channel's been around for almost a year and a half now. We just hit a thousand subscribers for whatever that's worth. But um, I went on a site that lets you license music. I told this story once before, but I went on a site that lets you license music and you know, you can, you pay a monthly subscription price and you can use the music, which is free music created by people specifically so that you could use it and stuff. And uh, I found a little a jazz song that I really liked a little, little melody. And I was uh, talking to one of the people on the donation coder site, who's a musician. He's like, yeah, of course you like that. That's Miles Davis. That's, that's a, like a, that's like a very famous, I think it was Miles Davis. Anyway, it was a very famous song melody. So I was like, oh, okay. That's a little dangerous to be using that. Even though YouTube didn't um, do any copyright strikes. But um, one of my favorite shows of all time is The Odd Couple. Oh, we're, I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about The Odd Couple intro. All right. So anyway, so I dropped that, that amazing Miles Davis melody song. And I asked my friend Zach. I forgot how it came up. But the music, you're, the bumper music is music by Zachary Brown's cousin in France who makes electronic music. And I asked Zach to ask his cousin if we could have permission to use it for the channel. And he said, yes. And that's what you're hearing. It's a little bit of like techno-y thing, but I like it a lot too. And if I had it here, if I had control over it, I could I'd play it so you could hear it. Um, I guess if I switch to the... Break. You hear it every time I go to break. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to hear it again. All right, that's the story of that. It's Zachary Brown's cousin. All right, let's begin the case here. Dear private detectives, I'm so glad I can count on you. I hope you can help me figure out who stole the Midnight Crown. The Great Falls Police Department transferred the case to the local force in New Haven and I'm the inspector responsible for the case. We've already done some work, of course. In this envelope, I'm sending you all the information I have that might help you out. Please read it carefully, take notes, and draw smart conclusions. If you haven't given me your phone number yet, you can enter it at... Oba. It's really important that you enter your phone number so I can reach you. Please do so before you continue reading. I've saved some information digitally for you as well. You can access it directly from the police server at www.newhavenpolice.com. Please use my login information to download the files. You know my name after all. I can't write down my password for you, so I've added a couple of verses by one of my favorite poets on the back. I'm counting on you. I hope you can help me, Jason Mahoney. That's what the envelope was written from Inspector Jason Mahoney. And in case we need to look at it, here it is here. Inspector Jason Mahoney, Police Headquarters, New Haven, 10058. So he's already started us out with a website, and he's not writing down his password. Okay, so the, the game is afoot, as one would say. All right, let's go to the tablet here. Let's, oops, that's it. Okay. Let's. Let's go to this website. Okay. It's okay if you call. I don't answer the phone anyway. 
New Haven Police. .com. All right. So I'm just going to bookmark this on the bookmarks bar. All right. So here it is. Here's the New Haven Police server. Pretty cool. All right. So we've got inspector's first name. Could be capitalized. We don't, or not capitalized. We don't know. Jason Mahoney. Okay. Now badge ID or password. Can't write down my password. So I've added a couple of verses by one of my favorite poets on the back. So let's take a look at this. Time slips away so quickly. Flows slowly through the glass when all the grains have trickled down an hour has come to pass. I turn the glass another time and we're back at the start. The grains, they have no choice at all. They run down the long glass wall and through the narrow shaft. J. L. Graham. I believe that somewhere um not here but maybe on their website it was saying something about don't go searching on google for things like when you when you're supposed to go to a website internet you go to the website they tell you okay police server password time slips away flows through the glass when all the grains have trickled down. And there's an arrow, it's on down, but I can't tell if it means this whole thing. So Jonathan is suggesting maybe it's sand. Maybe it's sand. All right, let's try sand. Nope. Oh, now it wants us to type in that again. All right, let me just back up here. All right, so now we don't know if this should be uppercase or lowercase. I'm just going to try a couple of versions on this. Just to make sure. No. All right. I'm going to leave this in capitals, even though I don't know. I'm going to, this is one of these things. This is where you start to see, um, we server password. All right. So Duke of Zill is guessing hourglass. We're doing a lot of guessing here. Okay. Okay. Well, hourglass was it. All right. That was kind of quick. Makes sense. You guys were ahead of me here. Okay, so it's just, so it's uh, just about an hourglass. All right. All right, let's see what we've got here. Theft of the Midnight Crown. Great Falls. We can listen to a press release from Great Falls today. Great Falls press conference. We can go to an internal schedule planning tool. Processing says, case still unsolved, external support requested, two recordings are available, one link. Okay. Whoa, what is this? Theft of the Midnight Crown, Great Falls. Oh, look at this. This is from previous case. This is the first case, it looks like. Possibly. And these are future cases that don't haven't been done yet. Actually, this case is not done either. These are future cases. Okay. All right. We've only got this one here. All right. Shall we listen to the this? Now, uh, the question is, will you hear it? You should be able to hear it. All right. Let me know if you hear this when I play it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Friday, February 21st, and this is Great Falls Today. Are you hearing this? February 21st. Last evening, the I famous forget. Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and system. Culture during the museum night event. 
The crown was on exhibit for a several-week engagement okay, and was located in the back of the museum. Since there was a reading going on that right. evening well, in the museum is, foyer know. with famous it's author overseas. Sandra Swarin, guest attention was directed again. towards that area. So far, according to eyewitnesses who viewed the crown, the police have determined that it must have been stolen between 1 and 3 a.m. So far, the police have not found any other clues on the freestanding glass display case where the crown was located. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. And it was quickly noted that this was not real gold. The pyrite is known as fool's gold for its ability to trick the unlucky finder. The meaning of this pyrite is yet unclear. The crown was supposed to be leaving the museum the next day by normal channels. As a family heirloom of the Havmeyer family, it was supposed to have been worn at the wedding between the family's youngest daughter, Helena, and her future, significantly less wealthy husband, Victor Garfield. Celebrity watchers report that the wedding has been canceled on short notice due to the incident. The police are investigating. Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, and 19, and the super number 1, took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. Oh. Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, 19, and the super number 1 took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. Low pressure system Erica is slowly moving over Great Falls and surrounding counties, bringing heavy rain and storms to the area. Temperatures will once again be falling significantly to between 37 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Erica will be moving out of the area in midweek and sunny days will be returning. This has been Great Falls Today. Have a great day, everyone. All right, so you've listened to that now, but I have not listened to it at all. Let's see. I apologize for that. Normally I would have gotten this configured properly. Let's see what I can do here. Hello, All right, I'm going to listen to this now. Last evening, the famous Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and Culture during the museum night event. The crown was on exhibit for a several-week engagement and was located in the back of the museum. Since there was a reading going on that evening in the museum foyer with famous author Sandra Swarin, guest attention was directed towards that area. So far, according to eyewitnesses who viewed the crown, the police have determined that it must have been stolen between 1 and 3 a.m. So far, the police have not found any other clues on the freestanding glass display case where the crown was located. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. And it was quickly noted that this was not real gold. The pyrite is known as fool's gold for its ability to trick the unlucky finder. The meaning of this pyrite is yet unclear. The crown was supposed to be leaving the museum the next day by normal channels. As a family heirloom of the Havmeyer family, it was supposed to have been worn at the wedding between the family's youngest daughter, Helena, and her future, significantly less wealthy husband, Victor Garfield. Celebrity watchers report that the wedding has been canceled on short notice due to the incident. The police are investigating. Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, and 19, and the super number 1, took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. 
Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, 19, and the super number 1 took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. Low-pressure system Erica is slowly moving over Great Falls and surrounding counties, bringing heavy rain and storms to the area. Temperatures will once again be falling significantly to between 37 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Erica will be moving out of the area in midweek, and sunny days will be returning. This has been Great Falls Today. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, sorry about that. You guys could hear that okay when I played it out loud? Duke of Zill says, it's interesting how some parts are repeated. Yes, that was a little interesting how some parts were repeated. All right, assuming you can hear that out loud well enough, let's listen to the next one. And if not, I can switch it back so you can hear it more clearly. Let's listen to this next piece. Mr. Jason Mahoney from the New Haven Police Force, who is heading up the case, will now take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much that so many of you have joined us today. As you all know, yesterday evening, the Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and Culture in Great Falls during the Museum Night event. Based on our initial findings, it appears the perpetrators removed the crown from the rear exhibition hall, where it was located in a freestanding glass display case. According to witness statements, we currently believe that the theft took place between 1 and 3 a.m. It is not possible to narrow down the time any more than that at the moment, since we do not have access to surveillance footage from the Museum of Art and Culture. We request that all visitors who were in the museum during the time in question that evening and who may have relevant information contact our police department. I'm now available to take questions from the audience. Yes, the woman all the way in the back, please. Why don't you have any surveillance footage? According to the security company responsible for surveillance, there was a technical defect on that evening, causing most of the recordings to be lost. We are currently attempting to restore at least some of the material. However, it is unclear whether we will be successful. The woman in the fourth row, second from the right, please. Do you believe the technical defect was a coincidence? Or that it may have had something to do with the theft. We are not making any speculations. We do not currently know whether the technical defect and the theft are related. However, we are still investigating the issue. The man here in the front with the gray hair and the blazer, please. Yes, um, hello. My name is Cecil Shu. We're getting a phone call. No, we're not. We're getting a message. <laughs> right at that. Some of you here might know me. I, I am a supporter of the arts and an art collector. As a representative of the Great Falls Collectors Society, uh, I was wondering whether the police have any information on where the crown is now. No, Mr. Schubert. As I said, we don't know anything yet about the crown's whereabouts. But, um, uh, do you think it's still close by in the area? Unfortunately, we cannot make any statements at this time. Yes, Miss Lamb from the Great Falls Tribune, please. The crown was supposed to be worn tomorrow evening during Helena Havemeyer and Victor Garfield's wedding. Sources say the wedding has been canceled due to the incident. Do you have any more information? Yes, the crown was owned by the Havemeyer family and was supposed to be worn by Helena Havemeyer, as the family tradition has been for many years. The wedding has been canceled. However, this is not relevant to the case at this time. Thank you all for coming today. Please excuse this brief press conference. But right now, we need all the resources we can muster to investigate the disappearance of the Midnight Crown. We thank you for your understanding. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for taking part in the press conference. Please make sure you don't leave anything behind in the hall. Okay. So, couple things. 
First of all, there was whispering at the very beginning, whispering at the end, that had some people, you probably couldn't hear it, I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but there were words people were saying, and we might, um, we might try to listen again. And then Duke is always joking about the guy actually asking if they know where the crown is. What was the technical defect? Was that the pyrite thing they're talking about? Or was that something else that I missed? What was the technical defect they were talking about? We might, it might fill in more when we read, but I think I might have missed that. Shall we listen to it again? Or can you fill me in on what the technical defect is? I'll keep this page open. At some point, I'm sure we'll listen to it again. If only to hear the... Um... The security company. Oh, that the security footage was not recorded. So that's a little bit of a, a translation issue. Instead, it's it's like technical snafu, not defect, right? Technical mishap that the security cameras weren't recorded. Okay, fine. All right, we'll come back to this before. I did write down the jackpot numbers in case those turn out to be someone used them for some code or something. The pyrite was the fake gold left in place of the crown, yes. Fake gold, known as fool's gold, left in place of the crown. We don't know what the significance of that is. Uh, was, the crown is owned by a family. They were going to use it for a wedding. Now that it's stolen, the wedding is turned is canceled, etc. Okay, so let's open this link in a new tab and see if it's what we've got here. This is the... Oh, that's just the picture. See. Planning tool. If you are hired, you will receive access details from the lead investigator. I see. So we don't have access to the to the planning tool yet. I see. We can just close it with this. All right. Fool's gold might be a message directed at the rich family. Absolutely. That's a pretty, we've already now, this is some serious multimedia production that they've made, that they've recorded those full press conferences with full voice actors. Pretty impressive. I'm curious to see if we can, not might pick up some whispering in that press conference from people in the audience, but maybe we'll check that out later. All right, so let's write down, though, that we've got the police schedule planning. I wonder what that's all about. But we need a login for that. What does it want to know when we try to log in? Just a login name. It says, if you're hired, you'll receive access details from the lead investigators. Okay, maybe he's going to give that to us a bit later when he calls which I'm still, hope, still hoping he'll call. Okay. Um, let's see what we've got next. That beeping you're hearing is not a phone call. It's a message, which maybe I can turn off. Okay. Can't turn off. Don't know how to use my phone enough to turn off. Hopefully there won't be too many messages coming in. Okay, let's continue on here. Inspector Francis Swan, case number B564, created 221. It's a handover form. Regarding the theft of the Midnight Crown on the night of February 20th, 2020. So let's take our notes here. Stolen... February 20th at 305 and we know oh, we also got from those press conferences the theft happened from somewhere between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. from the rear okay 305 a.m. February 21st an emergency call was received
by the Great Falls Police Headquarters. Inspector Jason Mahoney, member of the New Haven Police Department, was close to the scene with his patrol car at the time of the incident and was informed via radio. He arrived at 3.12 a.m. at the scene of the crime, the Museum of Art and Culture in Great Falls. After his arrival, the inspector investigated the crime scene. It quickly became clear that a theft had occurred and that the Midnight Crown, which was on temporary exhibition at the museum, was gone. The lock on the glass display case where the crown was stored had been broken and the piece had been stolen. A golden nugget was left behind in place of the crown. It was quickly noted that it was pyrite. Thus far, the exact time of the crime is unknown, somewhere between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. No other clues were found at the crime scene itself, and there were no fingerprints on the glass display case. The time the crime was committed, there were around 60 people in the museum, since it was a special museum night event in Great Falls and other surrounding towns. That's interesting. So even though it was stolen between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., the museum was filled with people, presumably in different other another room. Due to his extensive experience with crimes like this, the Great Falls Police entrusted Inspector Mahoney from the New Haven Police with the case. Okay, so this is just transferring responsibility to Inspector Mahoney, who's the guy who's contacted us. All right. Okay. I've got to figure out a way. This is this this is a bit of a rough stream with the use of the phone. What I'd like to really do is turn off notifications. But there we go. That's fine. That's it. I've turned off notifications. That's fine. Okay. So this just looks like a perfunctory transfer order. All right, so look, here's a scheduling document. We know the theft happened on 220, which is here. I'm not sure whose uh, file we're looking at here. The only thing they've written down here is Epiphany on January 6th. Don't know what that's about or why this would be. This might be for us to fill out. This might be to help us fill out stuff. I'm going to put this aside with the suspect list. That, that I have a feeling that's for us to make notes on. All right, let's look what we got here. From the Great Falls City Administrator, Department of Arts and Culture, Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. Okay. Subject, Midnight Crown in New York. So January 3rd, Dear museum operator, this year, as a, as a sister city to Monte Carlo in Monaco, the city of Great Falls has the honor of exhibiting the famous Midnight Crown for several weeks in one of our museums before it returns to the possession of the Havemeyer family. All of the museums in the city are able to apply to host this unique exhibition. To apply, please submit a brief application using the following form. The decision on which museum will be chosen able to exhibit this unique piece will be made in late January before the Midnight Crown is sent to its new temporary home on 2-7-2020. We look forward to receiving your application. So it sounds like we should probably be keeping, uh, unless we wanted to write on this document, which I don't want to, we should be keeping our own timetable. So on January 3rd, Letter, we've got the letter about applying to exhibit. And then it says on 2-7, it goes to its new temporary home, which we don't know where that is. All right. Suzanne Karsten. Okay, so it looks like they applied and they were denied. So here's their application. Contact person Alice Fuller. Primary focus is American art. 
Cover letter. The Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts opened just a few months ago and has already become a major attraction in the region. Our unique exhibition entitled World of Color is drawing huge crowds of visitors. We would appreciate the opportunity to exhibit the famous Midnight Crown at our museum. Rejected. Okay, so they were asking to have it from 2-7 to 221. I see. They want they wanted people to apply now. They're gonna make a decision in late January. Then it goes to its temporary home in 27, and then you can request to show it after the 7th. So they requested from the 7th to the 21st. It was denied. All right. Don't know what to make of that. All right. We've got two preservation of evidence sheets. Let's see what we got. Inspector Jason Mahoney on 224 found at 30 Delmar Place. 30 Delmar Place. The Museum of Fine Arts is at 18 Delmar Place. This is at 30 Delmar Place. We have a map. I wonder if we shouldn't get out our map here. So there's the Museum of Fine Arts at 18 Delmar Place, which is where? There's Delmar Place here. It looks like, oh, there are our uh, guy's calling us. All right, let's listen to this call. Yes, hello? It's Jason Mahoney again. Please put me on speaker again so that everyone can listen in. Listen, we don't have a lot of time. Please listen carefully. I'm out on the beat right now, and I need your help. It looks like Frank Rippon is on the lam. We're trying to find him right now so that we can interrogate him. Witnesses saw him get onto a bus at the Napierville station. We checked his credit card data, and we know what tickets he bought. Unfortunately, we don't know where he went with them. Maybe you've checked out our internal schedule planning tool on the police server? I'm sure you've seen that page already. If not, you can find the URL in my letter to you. The tool is active now. Please use the password tracking and dial in, okay? The password is tracking. After you've logged in, you can check out the most important information there. Use the tool to tell me where Frank Rippon is hiding. Then I'll go right there and try to detain him. So, what are you waiting for? Okay. So, we got that a little prematurely since we took our breaks and stuff. But basically, he's called to tell us this person, Frank Ribbon, is on the run. Maybe he's, we're going to encounter him in our case. And we could use the tracking tool to find him, uh, log into the tracking tool. But we're not going to do that yet because we don't we we don't know how that's relevant to us yet. I'm going to assume that nothing bad's going to happen. I'm assuming he's not going to call us back and say, "Hey, I found him on my own." No thanks to you. But let's see. Okay, so 18 Del Mar. Looks like it's there, that blue thing. That's the Museum of Fine Arts. And then we've got Museum of Arts and Culture is at 55 Westover Gate. There's Westover, so that's going to be here probably. Is that 55? Yes, okay, so the blues are the museum. So that's the Museum of Art and Culture. Then there's a gallery, a library, some synagogue, chapel, hotels, restaurants. All right, um, and just to remind us, the... Museum of Art and Culture is where it was stolen. 
museum. So not the Museum of Fine Arts, but this museum here is where it was stolen from. And we just looked at the other museum applied. The other museum applied to host it here and were denied. But these people got it, it looks like. Okay. So let's just put this up here so we can refer to it when we need to. All right, let's see what else we got here. Screenshot of PC in room six. Found at 30 Delmar Place. Where, what is 30 Delmar Place? Okay, 30 Delmar Place is the Mont Lake Hotel. So we don't know why this is relevant yet, but obviously they've tracked someone to the hotel who's buying a glass cutter. And someone has got, in room six, someone is traveling from this hotel at 30 Del Mar Place, taking directions to the Museum of Art and Culture here. So there they are, taking 18 minutes to go by foot, it looks like, one mile, 18 minutes. to the scene of the crime. Okay, so when we find some part, some person who's in this hotel room, room six, they've tracked their browsing history. We can see they ordered a glass cutter that was delivered on the 13th, and then they mapped on the 24th, uh, no, not on the 24th here. On the 19th, they did this map. So the day before the crime, they mapped it. They mapped out how to get to that museum. Okay, so let's put these aside for now. Um, until we know who that is, it's in room six of the Montlake Hotel. Let's continue our reading here. Museum of Art and Culture. This is the place where it was stolen. Let us begin by expressing, dear Mr. Dunn, subject museum, camera. This is on the 25th of February, so a few days after the robbery. Uh, the surveillance people are writing this letter. Dear Mr. Dunn, let us begin by expressing our deepest sympathies for the terrible crime committed against your museum, which you told us about over the phone. As discussed, we have reviewed the records from the surveillance cameras we installed in the museum in October of 2018. The recordings are always transmitted directly to our servers. Unfortunately, I regret to inform you that we have been having connection problems with the camera system installed at your facility for quite some time, and there have been repeated outages in recent months. One such outage occurred on the night of 2020-2020 due to an unexpected system error on our servers. Therefore, we were sadly not able to evaluate the data from the surveillance camera installed in your museum. Eh, no big deal. That's millions of dollars of theft that you're about to be sued for. A team of specialists is currently working to save some of the recordings, and they may have already been able to do so by the time you receive this letter. Since I will no longer be responsible for this matter, but instead I'm turning it over to the IT department, Please send an email with the subject museum camera to the tech department at orwelltruman.com. If the team ha has succeeded, you will receive the materials they have been able to save in a reply email. Please remember to check your spam folder. Of course, I greatly regret that this incident has occurred. We have now found and corrected the software error and that was responsible for the ongoing outages. In the future, your cameras will work properly. Gus Sanders. Okay. So another online mechanic, we're going to actually send an email to them and get a response back. I guess we might as well do this now. I'm going to go over here and go to my mail client, which I don't need to show you logging into. And I'm going to compose a message. 
Okay, and it's to text apartment at. And you guys can do this at home if you wanted to, of course. At Truman, CarlsTruman.com. And the subject is Museum Camera. And I'll just say, send me what you've got. Okay. And we'll hopefully get some response soon. Oh, here, I got a response right away. Let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, let's, let's show this to you. Okay. Um, to whom it may concern, thank you very much for your email. Of course, we know that these recordings are a matter of the utmost urgency for you. Because of this, we have done everything possible to analyze several images from the surveillance camera. Attached are the images we were able to save. We hope that these will help you and would like to once again apologize for our system failure. If the camera images do not display correctly, you can also view them here in a PDF file. So let's see, are they attached here? Yes, they are. Okay. So we've got two images. Let's see if they'll zoom in. Uh, what is this going to do? Okay, that's fine, except it won't let me scan around. So how am I supposed to? All right, well, we've got two photographs here. One with the crown, the upper one shows the crown still there. The lower one shows the crown gone, replaced by the pyrite. And we've got times there. 1.26 a.m., the crown was there. 1.33 a.m., crown gone. So now we know exactly when it was taken. Between 1.26 a.m. and 1.33 a.m. I believe that that's all that's going to be relevant to us in these photographs, but uh, I will try to zoom in. And get a better view of that, but it's not going to happen until we go to break because this thing will not let me. Oh, there it goes. Okay, good. All right, so there is the pyrite. All right, we're at max zoom now. So there's the pyrite. Do you see any other difference here? There's a little guy with a sailor in the photograph above. I presume it's going to be the same here. Nothing changed about that. What about in this case next to it? There's the, there it is before the theft. I see three little notes. Here, three little notes, and they look the same to me. All right, does anyone else spot any difference? It looks like it's just giving us time of crime to me. Duke of Zill says, was there evidence of glass being cut at the scene of the crime? Well, we were told that the lock was broken. I don't know if that means, let's see if we can see anything broken. I don't really, does that look like a hole in the glass here? Let's see if that's in this one. I can't really say that I see, it does look like maybe that's a hole in the left side. To me but I can't really tell. 
like right here. Does that look like there's a hole here? Kind of does. It says it broke a lock, but I'm not sure exactly what that means. We'll see if there's more details later about it. All right, back back to our shop here. Uh, okay, so he's apologizing. We signed on. We've got the photographs. That's all that seems like was important in his email. Francis Berman is the name of the camera system technician, in case we suspect him, but I don't know how we would suspect him if he's uh, if he's got these images. Unless they're fake images, it does give us a very specific timeline. Just to confirm, 1.26 a.m., the crown is there. 1.33, it's gone. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've got the camera name and stuff. All right, so nothing else of interest in that email. All right, what have we got here? Conversation saved on the tablet of 845-479-XXX33. So some tablet, we don't know, we don't know where this was found. Let's re, let's re, let's take a look at this. So it's a phone call made to someone or from someone on February 10th. Hey bro, I tried my hand at online poker again yesterday. Unfortunately, that did not go as planned, but then later I had an idea. You're really close to the source, aren't you? What would happen if something just grew legs and walked home with you one of these days? You and your money problems. Can't you think about anything else? You didn't answer my question. You know you've thought about it. Yeah, maybe I've thought about it. When you're dealing with priceless artifacts in day, at, day in, day out, you can't help but think about it. But I would only do something like that if I knew it wasn't going to cost the museum any money. Says, ha, only you would say something like that. Anyway, it's all covered by insurance, right? Your argument makes no sense. He says, hmm, I guess you're right. That would be easy to check. That would be easy to check. So this guy's telling him to steal something and he's saying only if it's under if it's got insurance. And then he says, hmm, I could check that. I could check if it's got insurance before I try to steal it. Gotta go. You ever coming over, man? For sure I'll come by. So we've got times and dates. February 10th, we've got a phone number. And then we've got a phone number of the person who's receiving these one number of times so we've got a sender and a recipient and a date and a time okay sounds like a worker in the museum is considering stealing it maybe we can find him checking for insurance all right here we go museum of art and culture this is where it was stolen from. This looks like their web page. Please note, cut out social media. What does that say? Cut out social media. Supernet, super user. What does that actually say? Supernet, it says media supernet. Okay. Uh, last online, 2, 3, 20, uh, February 3rd at 12.30 noon. We are proud to announce that we have been selected to temporarily exhibit the famous Midnight Crown at our museum. The exhibit will start on February 7th. We're so happy to share this news with you. Okay, so someone posted on the 3rd that we are going to be hosting this. We are going to be having an exhibit of this thing. We were chosen. And then here are some comments. What a terrible choice. Your security system has got to be the worst in New York. You're going to get be so screwed if something happens. <laughs> 16 upvotes, three forwards, one comment. I don't, Samantha says, I don't get it either. That museum is so outdated and the curtains stink. Michelle says, I think it's sad that basically everybody knows Cecil Schubert had his finger on the scale when they chose the museum for the exhibition. After all, he's basically the patron of the Museum of Art and Culture. 
What about a donation to the city? So everyone is saying like this museum, the Museum of Art and Culture, where it hosted and got stolen from, is was cheated to get to get it listed to get the exhibit there. All right, we don't have a web page to go to. All right, what have we got here? Leona Lamb, February fourth. That would be Valentine's Day. This is John Olson's email. So these must be messages from Leona or to, to Leona. So John Olson, who's the thing we're looking at. Let's see. So here's his, he's got letter, he's got emails to Leona, pitch online, chat online, ad, city administration store, health insurance, invoice, top chef. Marion Murphy, newsletter, Brendan, something. Okay. He's writing to Leona on February 14th. Oh, shit, that sounds bad. Keep your chin up. I'm coming back on the 20th, and we'll get started reporting on the museum night event right away. We will have plenty of time to talk, and you can bring me up to date. Sorry, but the pool is calling. I added a couple of days to my vacation so I can go swimming with a good conscience. John. Leona writes back. Uh, I see. They're sorted in reversed order. So here's the first one. And then it goes this way. So let's start down here. On February 3rd, he writes, Morning, Leona. Do you want to get together later and talk over research on the supermarket thing after copy deadline? I was just at your table, but I couldn't find you. So this guy, John Olson, is an editor at the Great Falls Tribune. Leona Lamb is an editor, at the, another editor. She says, that works, but I'm doing research again, so I'm out. My new home away from home, as it were. Let's meet at the coffee shop for a quick latte at 2. It's halfway between you and me. Earlier, I saw that they opened back up. See you later. Okay, then he says, greetings from sunny Florida. Oh, this is now... Um... 11 days later. Greetings from sunny Florida. The sun is shining and the beach shoot was amazing. Almost as hot as the weather. Best job ever. How's life back in gray old New York? She replies 20, 10 minutes later. I hate you. Just be glad you're not here. It's so boring. Really nothing going on. I'm glad it's the weekend now. Definitely time for something exciting to happen that's worth reporting about. The boss is already getting people, letting people go. And next Thursday, I'm definitely... I'm going to spend a couple of hours clearing out the archives because there's nothing else to do. Oh man, I'm getting a little bit worried about it. But you enjoy your business trip if you can call shooting photos on the beach in Florida business. Then he says, that sounds bad. Keep your chin up. I'm coming back on the 20th. We'll start reporting on the museum night event. We have plenty of time to talk. You can bring me up to date. Okay, so two editors at the Tribune, she's worried about getting fired because things are so slow in town. Hopefully something exciting will happen, she says. Olsen and Leona Lamb. This sounds like a reference to Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane, says uh, Duke of Zill in the channel. And Jonathan Warner says Alice in Wonderland is Alice Fuller from the other museum. Where is the... Alice in Wonderland. Ah, I see. Do you think Alice is from the other museum? Alice Fuller is the person who applied to have it hosted at the other museum. That's interesting. Okay, let's continue. What have we got here? This is another thing from 30 Del Mar Place, which is the same hotel that these are from. Uh, here we go. So it's showing what rooms were occupied. So they went, police and went and got this on the 25th. So we know these things about the glass cutter and the map to the museum were taken on the 19th. So. Taken on the 19th, he's checking, they're checking the overview, ordered on the 8th, delivered on the 13th. Um, so, on the 
19th, but this was delivered. I see, it doesn't show when it's delivered. So this is a person in their hotel on the 19th checking their orders. And this is a person on the 19th getting a map of how to go there. Okay, so if we look at this, on the 19th, someone occupied a room, a single, UF single, unfurnished, what do you think UF means? GF, UF. Okay, room six is highlight. See, it's a different color. So I think they've selected it, and it's told us Frank Rippon arrived February 19th. Guest has not checked out. Okay, so that was the call that our guy gave us about Frank Ribbon. So now we know why he cares about Frank Ribbon. So what we're going to write is that he's in room 6. February 19 to the 22nd. And presumably what? Is today the 25th or 26th? Do we have a current date of today when he called us? Don't know. But presumably since this was printed out on the 25th, it couldn't be anytime sooner. So... Frank Ribbon booked to the 22nd, arrived on the 19th, and as soon as he arrived, he checked the map and checked his glass ordering part. We don't know anything more about him. All right, so let's put that with him. We could now go check that ground floor, upper floor is Duke of Zill's guess about G4, GF, and UF. That makes sense. Broom closet. Someone's booked the broom closet. <laughs> Jonathan says, who's occupying the broom closet? Um, so the is this the scheduling thing? He The detective wanted us to log in and check, let's, let's go to that page and log in and see what, what information we would have got, what he wanted us to get us here. He said the password was, he said the password was tracking, not the login name. Yeah. Oh yeah, but that's it. Okay, so a little bit of typo in translation. All right, so here's the New Haven Police Schedule Planning Tool. Notes from the last investigator. Suspect Frank Rippon seems to have disappeared. Credit card statement requested to track the suspect. Analysis of recent transactions indicates a pattern of movement. Suspect seems to have been escaping in a hurry. Eyewitness indicate they saw the suspect at Naperville Station. This is stuff he told us on the phone call. Inspector Mahoney to question other passengers on the way to Naperville Station. Suspect movement patterns must be tracked. Pursuit will begin once possible location is found. Chronological analysis of suspect's pattern of movement based on credit card data. So I guess what we're looking at here, it's this police schedule planning tool, but are, is, what, is what we're looking at his credit card usage? It's a little confusing why this is called police schedule planning tool. It looks like it's more like a timeline analysis tool. So chronological analysis of suspect's pattern of movement based on credit card data. He got a bus ticket for one station, then a tram ticket, then a metro ticket, then a bus ticket, then a city bike ticket, then a tram ticket, then a bus ticket, then a city bike ticket. Is that where it's supposed to be? To send the suspect location to the lead investigator by clicking on it, then the pursuit will begin. Avoid incorrect information because the suspect is still on the run. I see. We're going to click somewhere to send him to get the person. Hello, detective. This is our schedule planning tool. You can always see my current position on the map. Once you know where the fugitive is hiding, click the location. I will go there as soon as possible, then begin my pursuit.
Duke of Zilsos, do we even know who Frank Riven is? No, we absolutely do not have this. We haven't heard anything about him except that he's in the room where they found this stuff. But I guess we don't know why we were to find Frank Riven yet. All right, so let's just put this aside for now. But this sounds like, look, this map shows Metro Tram Bus City Bike. So I'm thinking if this would be how we would find him. From some place, he took a bus, then a tram, then a metro, then a bus, then a bike, then a tram, then a bus, then a bike. And it tells us how many stops he went. So based on that, if we know where he starts, and what was, then we should, we might be able to track exactly where he would be. They saw the suspect at Naperville Station. So we know at some point he passed through Naperville. Um, okay, so we'll come back to this once we know a little bit about where he is. Duke of Zell says this is an interactive version of the Bureau of Investigation finales. I don't think this is the finale thing. I think this is just one step further. Like, I think we could figure this out right now where he is. And then our detective will find him and he's going to be innocent or something. Um, I think we could locate this right now with some clever puzzle solving. But I'm going to put this aside for the time being. Don't spend your time on this yet. We'll come back to this when it's time. Let's check out the rest of our evidence. Or should we view this like this is... No, we don't know why we're tracking him. Let's, I think we should go through this until we find a little more information about how we got to Frank Ribbon. Let's come back and um, let's look at our fingerprints here. So this is just stuff out of order. I wonder if we shouldn't have put this, tried to put this stuff in order first. Okay, we've got a bunch of fingerprints. There's Alice Fuller, the person who runs the other museum. John Olson is the newspaper reporter who's on vacation. Dylan Dunn and Edgar Dunn and Cecil Schubert. I can't remember what how they're relevant to our case yet. But since we have no fingerprints to match up with, we'll just put this aside for now. Okay, but if we get fingerprints, we can check them here. Okay, here's a letter on the 13th, ensuring the glass display case. Dear Mr. Dunn, oh, Dunn is the um, care for life. Dunn must be the guy who's running this museum. Okay, so if we look at this, everyone knows Cecil Schubert has his finger on the scale when they chose the museum. He's basically the patron of the Museum of Art and Culture. So Cecil Dunn is the guy running the museum where it was stolen. And Cecil is don't know who Cecil is yet. All right, dear Mr. Dunn, after one of our specials completed an extensive review over the last few weeks and toured the grounds of the museum, I regret to inform you that we will not be able to ensure the glass display cases and their contents within the facilities of the Museum of Art and Culture in Great Falls. The glass display cases were not included under your previous insurance agreement since they were purchased after it was concluded and the glass does not fulfill ANSI Z97 standard. The glass display cases must be replaced in order to include pieces exhibited there under your insurance cover in case of a claim. You're welcome to contact us once you've done so. So here is an insurance company responding to Dunn that it's not covered. Now, if we look at that conversation on the tablet, remember where he was saying, hey, if it's insured, I'll rob it. So he says that would be easy to check. So it's possible that this green person, which is this number, presumably, is Mr. Dunn himself. 
Does, it, does the date make sense? This is on 2.10. So February 10th, he has this conversation where he says, let me check if, if we're insured. If we are, maybe I'll steal it. And here he's finding out they're not insured. So maybe that gives a, eliminates this person. We'll see if we can track this person down to being Mr. Dunn. Um, okay, maybe we take a little bit of a break here and uh, come back in eight minutes and resume. There's a lot of information, lots of timeline. We've got a lot more to go. This case could go long. I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Call for Two. We're playing Hidden Games <laughs> Crime Scene, Case Two, uh, The Midnight Crown. And I guess it, it's it, we're being flooded with lots of information. It's quite cool. Um, it's a little overwhelming at first, partly because all of these things feel like they're coming at us out of order, which is part of the challenge. But it does make me think maybe we should be getting this out and leaving notes here about who people are. So we actually, I have some post-its, so I can put post-it notes on each person so we can actually write. So we've got a couple people whose names we don't know. I guess we're going to be getting them later. If it's it's actually quite, um, you can see that one of the things that these, that the old crime dossier books that we played recently are able to do is give you things in a specific order. And part of the charm of these document dump games is that you're given all of these documents that you don't know how they all fit together and what order to parse them in. But it's also a weird circumstance where we're like, we've got this map of people we don't, we haven't intro been introduced to yet. We know this is guy is the editor at the Tribune, John Olson. Here's someone, date of birth, these people, we don't know their names. Frank Rippon, we know he's in room six and has the glass cutter and map to museum. And we know he's on the run. I don't think he's going to be our culprit. Uh, we've got H Helen Havenmeyer. We know this is going to be the family that owned the crown. I'm not sure if she's the person who was getting married and called off her marriage yet. Let's uh, put this aside now that we've got this. I did make a scan in the interim of these two documents. I think we probably won't use this suspect mode of evidence notes. We'll just keep notes regular, but maybe we can start filling out on this copy here. So the 20th was the, where's my timeline card? The 20th was the date it was stolen. And maybe we'll just fill in the rest of the dates as we come across. I mean, there is interesting date information to know about, like when he got information that they're not insured and all that. But we'll worry about that later. All right, and I wonder if we talked about uh, in previous games how to organize documents and, you know, you can organize them by people, what evidence shows what people. This is all Frank Rippon, so I'm going to keep his stuff together. Some paper clips might be useful. But another way to organize documents is put the documents that feel like you're done with them, that you don't need to refer to them again in one pile. Okay, and then in fact, on our timeline sheet, I'm gonna put stolen between 126 and 133, and I'm gonna say according to the security camera recovery, because if we can't trust that, then does that time is off, but we don't know if we can trust it. All right. And then we've got people. Maybe we should, um, 
make some suspect cards for people that are mentioned that aren't on our map yet. So Alice Fuller. And then we want to note Jonathan's thing. Is she Alice in Wonderland from the social media? Okay, that's Alice Fuller. She is the... King Del Mar, which is Museum of Fine Arts. She's the director of that. Then we've got Dunn. He's the Museum of Art and Culture guy. At 55 Westgate. And that's where the crown was stolen from. Okay, then we've got the tablet conversation to and from. We don't know who either of those people are, but we've got phone numbers for them. And then we've got a mention here of Cecil Schubert, who we're told is the basically the patron of Museum of Art and Culture. It sounds like she's saying that he's the guy... Uh, who might be deciding where the jewels go. Who's the person who said apply for an application? Suzanne Karsten. I'm gonna put her down. Suzanne Karsten put out the call for applications to host. All right. Okay, then we had the newspaper. Sorry, I guess I should probably be showing you this. Then we had the uh, newspaper guy talking, John Olson, but he was talking to someone we might care about, and that was Leona... Lamb. She's another editor at the Falls Tribune with John Olson. And even though we have John Olson on our sheet, I'm going to make a card for him. John Olson. He's another editor at the Tribune. Okay. So presumably some of these people are going to be people on our map here. Then we've got fingerprints for Dylan Dunn. We don't know who he is. And Edgar Dunn. Do we know who the Dunns are? To have they come up yet? Okay. Ian Brown. Okay, so here we are. We're back ready to start new stuff, but now we have a list of suspects. We've got our better timeline. I think we're in a better position now to start, and we've got our suspect mind map, which we will fill out as we get closer to it, and we've got our map of the area.
Okay, let's continue reading anything in the chat. Duke of Zill says, yes, Dunn was the guy checking on the insurance. Good, okay, good point. Dear Mr. Dunn. So he, one of these Dunn's, let's just write, I'm just going to put a question mark, wrote insurance, question mark, wrote insurance. Question mark. So one of the Duns. Oh, here it says Mr. Dylan Dunn. Sorry, it does say Dylan Dunn. Okay, so not Edgar Dunn. Okay, so Dylan Dunn says wrote insurance on 21320. Okay, so it's possible that Dylan Dunn is the guy in this tablet conversation who's saying, I guess you're right, that would be easy to check. Maybe we can map his phone number to this, but okay, let's, that's fine, that's all good. All right, let's start reading new stuff here. Duke of Zill says, was he messaging his brother? Is that what you think it is? Is he talking to his brother? Hey, bro. Oh, good, 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 good observation. Smart. Hey, bro. Okay, so if we believe that that's true, then what we think is, according to the tablet, his number is 631 2300. This is on 210. And then 210 tablet. So then we think that that's Edgar writing. That's who this must be. In uh, He's in Las Vegas. So he's probably out of town, I believe. And then, although he's saying... You coming over for sure, I'll come by. Okay. Um, okay, so we think he is eight four five four seven three X X X three three question mark question mark. Okay, good, excellent. So the brother's encouraging him to steal. He's going to check insurance, but we think that he's going to he's out of he's out of the question because he found out it's not insured. All right, next up. What have we got here? Delilah Dandelion. So this looks like a dating site. Police note, encrypted chat from a public computer at 23 Westover Gate. 23 Westover Gate is the central library. Okay, so they found an encrypted chat on a service called Couple Up. Now, it says encrypted. Does that mean... They've decrypted it, or they think it's encoded language. Let's see what it says. Couple up. January 3rd, February 8th, February 14th, and then February 20th, the day of the crime. Let's track it down. Okay. Can you, let's see if I can give you super close up on this. Okay. So, Delilah Dandelion and Charlie. Let's make a little card for this. Encrypted chat. Okay. Charlie says, Hey, when am I going to see you again? I miss you so much. Delilah says, I miss you too, but it will never work. There's no going back for me. Please try to understand and don't make things worse than they already are. Charlie says, Don't make them worse. We're talking about your life here. Wake up. There's never, this is never going to make you happy. Delilah says, We're talking about so much more. You could never understand. Charlie says, 
I'm really getting pissed. You want to see me and I want to see you and I want to be a couple and we want to be a couple. So why are you resisting this? Oh, this is um, people having an affair maybe from the marriage. Okay, so why are you resisting this? And then she leaves. Then a month later, Charlie says, I heard the date on the radio today, not even a month, and I will have lost you forever. Yeah, this is the marriage that's being planned. And he, she's having an affair or they're in love. She's saying it doesn't matter anymore. This is the way things have to be. He says, please think about it a little more. We can run away together. Delilah says, please leave me alone. This is the only way I can be happy. I don't want to see you anymore. Then she leaves. Charlie says, so he, might, he writes to her on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day without you last year was so perfect. I sent you a letter, but it was returned unopened. Looked like you refused to accept it. And then the day of the theft. I really need to talk to you, says Charlie, right away. I know you don't want to hear from me, but what I have to tell you is going to completely change your decision. It's really, really important. Please, please respond. You are headed for a disaster. Charlie says, I'm at a total loss. In just two days, you're going to make the biggest mistake of your life, and I can't save you or stop you. Appearances can be deceiving. All that glitters is not gold. Mark my words. Well, that sure sounds like the pyrite that was left. So what we've got here is we've got Delilah and Charlie. We think Delilah is going to be the woman about to get married that we heard about in the press conference stuff. She's, I guess, uh, one of the Havemeyers. Charlie is someone she's having an affair with. And then right on the day of the theft, he's writing her to say, like, you're about to make a mistake. I found out something that you need to know. And then he says, all the glitters is not gold. So either he has stolen the crowns to stop the wedding or something like that. That sounds pretty, uh, sounds pretty tempting that that's a good motive for stealing that. Um, but we don't know who Charlie is. Presumably that's someone's fake alias, but whoever she's having an affair with. All right, let's continue on. All right, let's look at some of this stuff. We've got a betting slip. Oh my, okay. Betting slip and a hotel code stuff. Okay, so let's look at this betting slip. So it's on February 15th. Name Rambo for unborn baby rhino at the Great Falls Zoo to no rain Great Falls 1 to 0 score in the soccer match between Great Falls and Grass Valley. Combination bet. Better only wins by winning all three of the single bets above. So he's betting a $5 bet with a $500,000 payoff. And we've got fingerprints. So it's a, it's a bet. They All three things have to be true. The Rambo has to be what they named the unicorn baby. There has to be no rain on the 24th and a 1-0 to zero score in the soccer match. This might give someone an alibi for the 15th at 2.32. So, for example, if we looked at that uh, encrypted chat on the 2.15th, no, no, no chats happening on the 2.15th, but someone's got an alibi for the 15th, and someone's got fingerprints. So should we try to find these fingerprints? Where's our fingerprint? Okay, let's take a look at this. Whose fingerprints are these? Now I can see right now they're Edgar Dunn's. You can see that center little triangle there and there. Okay, so the betting slip, let's 
see. What have we got here? Got a little post-it. We can attach a little post-it here. We can write Edgar Dunn. And then on Edgar, Edgar Dunn's thing, I'm just going to put Matt bedding slip, which gives him an alibi for 215 at 232 p.m. I don't know why 215 is an important alibi or he's trying to win a lot of money. It's a crazy bet to make. You're but on the other hand, look, he's got his fingerprints on the back, too. That's pretty cool. On the other hand, it's not like he's betting a huge amount of money. Okay. Maybe we put these fingerprints out on the table where we can consult them again. All right. What do we make of this? It looks like a code. Found in room six. Of the hotel. Okay, so it's more room six. Reminder, contact Mr. X, code word safe cracker. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm guessing this is the secret message. And we might decrypt it with a separate thing we learn about or this word here, safe cracker. If you remember, if it's a one time pad, you would write like safe cracker and line up the letters and then add them. Okay, but we'll worry about this later. If we find some note, some code to decrypt it from room six, we can try decrypting with that, or we might try decrypting it with this phrase, safe cracker. But this is in Frank's hotel room. All right. Uh, this was our secret message we saw before. I might want to listen to the, um, we might want to listen to the press conference again to, to get the name of the people, the Havemeyer people that were going to get married. Did it say who Havemeyer was marrying? Let's listen to that again. Let's see, where was it? Did we have to go? Okay, let's listen to this again. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Friday, February 21st, and this is Great Falls Today. February 21st. Last evening, the famous Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and Culture during the museum night event. The crown was on exhibit for a several-week engagement and was located in the back of the museum. Since there was a reading going on that evening in the museum foyer with famous author Sandra Swarin, guest attention was directed towards that area. So far, according to eyewitnesses who viewed the crown, the police have determined that it must have been stolen between 1 and 3 a.m. So far, the police have not found any other clues on the freestanding glass display case where the crown was located. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. A piece of pyrite was left behind in place of the crown. <laughs> and it was quickly noted that this was not real gold. The pyrite is known as fool's gold for its ability to trick the unlucky finder. The meaning of this pyrite is yet unclear. The crown was supposed to be leaving the museum the next day by normal channels. As a family heirloom of the Havmeyer family, it was supposed to have been worn at the wedding between the family's youngest daughter, Helena, and her future, significantly less wealthy husband, Victor Garfield. Celeb okay, let's write that. So it is Helena. She's the one on our chart here. So Helena she 
She's the youngest. I also, um, she's to be married to Victor. Victor, who was it? Pretty Garfield, husband. Victor Garfield. Victor Garfield. Celebrity watchers report that the wedding has been canceled on short notice due to the incident. The police are investigating. Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, and 19, and the super number 1, took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. Somebody has won the jackpot. In the drawing on Wednesday, a ticket with the numbers 2, 4, 5, 8, 11, 19, and the super number 1, took home an unbelievable $36.5 million jackpot. The last time a winner from Great Falls won such a huge and historic prize was 1979. Low pressure system Erica is slowly moving over Great Falls and surrounding counties, bringing heavy rain and storms to the area. Temperatures will once again be falling significantly to between 37 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Erica will be moving out of the area in midweek, and sunny days will be returning. This has been Great Falls Today. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, so Helena, the youngest of the Habermeyer family, she was going to get married. So we think probably Delilah, I'm guessing, is Helena. But we don't know who she was having an affair with on that chat or who wanted to get back together. Um and in the chat in the chat, Duke is uh mentioning that Victor Garfield has less money. Let's write that down. Yes, they did say she's marrying someone with less money. Victor, so Victor might be on this chart somewhere. We don't know. Okay. Let's uh, let's go back to our evidence and see. We've got three photos. Let's see what we can make of this. Oh, cool. Here's the pyrite. Okay. So, golden nugget found in the glass case of the museum. Okay. Uh, I think it's just for fun. I don't, there doesn't seem to be anything of value in that. I mean, no clue for us. Photo from Leona Lamb's camera. Okay, so remember, Leona Lamb is the other editor at the Tribune. And she's taking a photo that's got a timestamp on it. And it says... 22120 130 a.m. So here it is exactly when the thing was was stolen. We know it was stolen between 126 and 133. So this seems like it might be her alibi. Although you could also say it proves she was in the museum. But let's make a note. Let's make a little thing up here. I'm just going to write alibi date question mark. So we don't forget that there's a date up in there. 1.30 a.m. And let's remember not to get thrown off by the date of the robbery. The robbery was on the night of the 20th, which is 1 a.m. on the 21st. So let's just not get messed up here. All right, so what have we got here? Photo of Dylan Dunn's desk. Okay, let's see what we've got on Dylan Dunn's desk. Check his voicemail. So there's his voicemail number. Shopping list is, sorry, shopping list, eggs, milk, Nutella, toilet paper, three ply. 
and he's got a picture of the beach. Okay, let's look at his phone number here. All right, check his voicemail. I don't under, I'm not sure what that telecom thing is, but that does not match anyone's number here. Okay, so I wonder if we're supposed to call this. I'm going to try calling this with my phone. I don't know what kind of cost it's going to entail us. But let's try calling this phone number. All right. Here we go. Are we going to wake a human up? Seven six six eight three three one. You have one new message. First message Monday, February seventeenth, twenty twenty. Hey, bro, this is Edgar. Want to go to the bar later? I just have to go turn in my lottery ticket real quick. I have a good feeling about this one. It's going to be a winner. Same numbers as always. After all, those are the only numbers I can remember. I use one for the super number. You know, I only have one favorite brother. It's you. So, call me later. So... We need to listen to that again. He's saying. He's, he wants to get together on February 17th. And he just has to do the lottery. Check, let's dial it again. You have one new message. First message. Monday, February 17th, 2020. Hey, bro, this is Edgar. Want to go to the bar later? I just have to go turn in my lottery ticket real quick. I have a good feeling about this one. It's going to be a winner. Same numbers as always. After all, those are the only numbers I can remember. I use one for the super number. You know, I only have one favorite brother. It's you. So, call me later. Okay, <laughs> I'm very impressed by the by the digital stuff accompanying this game. All right, so it's Edgar calling his brother, so we know this is the brother's voicemail number. Um, and he's talking about uh, filing his lottery ticket. He has got a good feeling. The super number was one, which is the number we know won the lottery, is super number one. And he says, I'm playing the same numbers as always. It's the only numbers I remember. So you might, we might ask if we could predict what his, if we could see anything that's got his numbers. I mean, we've got his phone number here. The numbers played in the lottery were two, four, five, Eight one one eight eleven nineteen. So we haven't seen those numbers anywhere else. It's not his phone number. But let's keep our eyes open. But it sounds like maybe he won the lottery. All right. And we know this is the Dylan's number. Okay, so that all makes sense. And February 17th, he's got an alibi for, for whatever, if that's a, of any importance to us. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. So here's the museum where the crown was not hosted. World of Color. Remember, they were saying in their application, World of Color has got lots of people. You should send us the crown because a lot of people are coming to see this exhibition. 
special exhibition from uh, February 11th, sorry, February 1st to February 29th, dive into the colorful world of American art and be inspired by the world of local and national artists. Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts welcomes you to our modern facility. Modern art from artists all over the world is yours to discover. Plan your visit today. Prices, museum hours, and a website. Now, um, let's look at our thing here, just to remind ourselves. It was stolen Thursday night heading into Friday. So hmm, the museum was open, but it was after closing hours anyway. Okay, let's uh, check out this website. mfawney.com with one N. Okay. Looks pretty believable. Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. Visit the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. Renowned collections in Great Falls. We look forward to your visit. The exhibitions and events offered at the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts are truly one of a kind. We want to welcome you to our museum, broaden your knowledge with one of our guided tours. The museum is a place to discover new ideas that will expand your horizon. Then it's got the office hour, the museum hours, which don't seem relevant to us. World of color. Okay, look at that art painting. You recognize that, right? All right, so now we've got a very solid alibi for one of our people. Because, look. There is the photo that Leona Lamb took during the episode right in the five minute window, 10 minute window when the crown was stolen, she's in the other art gallery. So we know that Leona Lamb is in, she's got an alibi. A very good alibi. She's in Museum Fine Arts during the theft. Okay, uh, that's that. But now Jonathan is pointing out that he sees a discrepancy in the hours of the museum between the brochure and the website. Let's look at that. The brochure says Monday closed 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Tuesday to Friday, and then 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday to Sunday, whereas the website says they're open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the website. So they basically have earlier hours on Saturday and Sunday, according to the website, by two hours. I don't know. I, that doesn't seem significant to me. It, just, it seems like just, you know, you print the brochure, you're stuck with it, and the website you can change anytime, or someone didn't get the message. I think the main thing here is that photo to give an alibi to Leona. But let's see what else we got here. News. We're looking for admissions counter employees. Contact us to learn more about positions. A whole new look. The interior designers in the gallery salon have been working hard and outfitted our museum with new flooring and benches. Creative competition will be starting soon on the topic of Great Falls, the hub of the world. We will be sharing participation info with you soon. Our museum is located in the heart of Great Falls, 2000 Delmar Place. That's wrong, too. I believe that's going to be another typo. Okay, so something to remember when we review it. Seems like there are some typos here. Delmar Place, this says it's it's located at 2000 Delmar Place. 2000 Delmar Place isn't even on our map or anywhere near it. So that's just going to be a typo. 
Uh, if you do arrive by car, we offer plenty of parking. And imprint, by the way, is just information about the website, I believe. It's like the hidden, yeah, it's just telling us that it's made by this game company. Okay, so I think the only thing of interest is that photograph. And to show us that there's a little bit of a typo. Okay, but Leona Lamb has a good alibi. All right. Duke says, is this Alice's museum? Um, yes, this is Alice's museum. This is Alice's Museum, the Museum of Fine Art, which is right, if you look at this map, at 18 Del Mar right here. This is a museum that applied for the crown, didn't get it. Here's the Art and Culture Museum that did get it, where it was stolen. We just went here. We saw that we've got a photograph from Leona showing that she was there on the night in question, so it couldn't have been her. We had a little bit of motive for her, don't forget, because she was saying how if the newspaper doesn't get some good stories soon, she's going to be out of a job. So we had a little bit of suspicion that she might be stealing that crown just to get attention. All right. The Great Falls public transit map. This looks like exactly the map that was on the website of the scheduling that we were going to use to tell us um, how to catch that guy, don't forget. So it's nice. We've got a printout here. We can work with it so we don't need the website map. It's a copy of it, but we could still use our Thing. So I wonder if this isn't time. Well, we're almost done. We're actually almost done with our documents. So this is exciting. Okay, so let's finish up our documents. We'll come back to this next. Yeah. Okay, so here's our map of our public transportation, which we're going to study in this minute. When we look at this, um, this is only open, we're told. I'm guessing this is going to be after we catch that guy, send him to the right place to catch the guy. All right, let's see what else. Here we're going to learn about the jackpot and the marriage. So here we go. Okay, this is kind of fun. Okay, February 18th, two days before the theft, $36.5 million jackpot. Great Falls Tribune. Okay, Great Falls' most famous couple is planning to tie the knot on, tie the knot on Saturday, February 22nd. Heiress Helena Havemeyer will be marrying her fiancé, Victor Garfield at St. Henry's Church in a private ceremony. The couple met on a trip to Spain while Victor Garfield was on a business trip as a foreign language correspondent. The family announced the wedding date on February 8th. So we could use this to confirm that encrypted chat was, well, I mean, we're fairly sure it's her, but this date would map, match up February 8th which is February 8th, where he says, I heard the date today on the radio. So yes, this is a conversation someone's having with Helena. Okay, so they announced the date on the 8th. Helena Havemeyer is the youngest of four sisters and the only one who's not yet married. New York tabloids have speculated that the family was pressuring their last single daughter to finally settle down and find a husband. The couple has only been together for a few months. Designer Wang Su Lang had the honor of being chosen to design the wedding dress. The dress will not be unveiled before the bride comes to the altar on Saturday, but sources say she will be wearing one family heirloom as an accessory, a decades-old tradition for the Havemeyers. That's the crown. Okay, so let's just add on our timetable that they were to get married on the 22nd. I'll just write wedding. They called it off, but that's when it was planned. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Generous donation. Cecil Schubert, well-known art collector. Okay, so remember him. He was mentioned in the social media post as being practically the patron of the Museum of, Fine, of Art and Culture, where the crown got. So now we've gotten information about him. He's a well-known patron and whiskey lover. 
I don't know why we care about whiskey. He's an art collector. Has once again provided a generous donation to the city of Great Falls, this time in the sum of 164000 Okay, so the question is, did he pay that money to get them to host the crown at his favorite museum? Schubert has proven his generosity to the city time and time again, donating a total of 74000 to several museums through Great Falls. In an interview with the Great Falls Tribune, he expressed his commitment to continue supporting museums in his chosen home of Great Falls as they seek to bring major artworks to the city's cultural landscape. I feel it is my duty as a citizen of Great Falls to use part of my fortune for good for the good of the public to provide as many people as possible access to culture and the art, Schubert said in an interview. Schubert made millions on the stock market as a successful trader, then purchased a luxurious estate in the city where he lived since. And look who wrote the article, uh, our woman, Leona Lamb. Okay, but, um, so he's given the city lots of money. So if he told the city, hey, I want you to host, the, I want you to put the crown in the exhibit in the fine arts, then maybe that's where they would. But from this, it sounds like he's given to all the museums. Okay, here we go. Here's an article. Sexy's back after a car accident. Stuck in a wheelchair no more after her car accident. Carrie Butcher is back. We don't know who she is, but I'm going to write her name back. Carrie Butcher is back and ready to pose for us. She misjudged a curve while she was driving. But as you can see here, her curves definitely shouldn't be underestimated. Photo series on page six. Here's our Olsen guy. Well, you can see where his mind is at. Okay. Uh, we don't get to see those photos, though. The hottest news from Great Fall. So do we write down Carrie Butcher? It doesn't seem like she's relevant to us, but I'll just put her down as the model. I don't know why we would care about her. Okay. Um, no information. Stuck in wheelchair no more. Okay. All right, here we go. It's an article about the museum night event. It all starts on February 20th. During this year's museum night, Great Falls Museums will once again be opening their doors to the public starting at 10 p.m., giving all the town's night owls a chance to wander through nationally acclaimed exhibitions and be inspired by masterpieces of art, technology, and sciences. Sounds like maybe all the museums we're open late at night on the 20th. The museums will also be staging lighting installations, theatrical performances, and live concerts to entertain guests. One of the crowning highlights of this year's museum night event is the world-renowned Midnight Crown. The 12th century treasure owned by the Habermeyer family will be on exhibit in the Museum of Art and Culture. It is a particularly complex and elegant piece consisting of 1,333 diamonds. Wow. Despite recent criticisms, the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts will also be taking part in the museum night event. Under the management of Alice Fuller, do we write down, I know we've got Alice Fuller. Yes, okay, we were, okay. Under the management of Alice Fuller, the museum also applied to exhibit the crown. The application was rejected by the city, after which Fuller made a negative statement about museum director Dylan Dunn. The museum night will end Friday morning at 4 a.m. Tickets are available from all participating museums. Okay, so Alice Fuller's museum was participating too and would have been open at night. So cute. Rhinoceroses. Oh, remember he did his combination bet? Let's see if this comes through. New arrival at the zoo excites guests and handlers. The Great Falls Zoo has a new attraction. Ellie, the zoo's five-year-old female rhinoceros, gave birth to a calf yesterday morning. The zoo had already publicized the gender of the calf, which is male. The baby rhinoceros weighs in at 60 pounds and made his appearance at 9.19 a.m. There he is, that cute little guy. That's a big baby. Great Falls residents could vote for their favorite name for the baby rhino on the Great Falls Zoo website through yesterday. The choices included names like Rambo, Colombo, and Miss Marple, Mr. Marple. 
Ultimately, Colombo won the most votes. Okay, so he lost his combination. This, whoever bet, which we think we know, lost the combination bet, right? Because the combination bet said Rambo was going to be its name. Okay, so this, this bet by Edgar was lost. Ultimately, Colombo won the most vet votes. Colombo, a famous detective. That's a, probably a little nod to that. Miss Marple as well. The zoo's newest resident made his debut before visitors yesterday afternoon, and he immediately found himself the center of attention. Today, visitors can see Colombo between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. in the rhino enclosure. He will be undergoing routine exams before that time. And then we've got little comments, visitor comments. I think he should have been named Torpedo, but Colombo is okay too. I heard rhinoceri are dying out. It's good we are doing something about it. This is definitely going to bring tourists into Great Falls. I'm glad the city is planning for the future. I'm going to go get myself a membership and go with my granddaughter every week. She's four and loves elephants. I want to cuddle little Columbo so much. If only his skin wasn't so rough. All right, and we've got some ads. Seeking internet access. My name is Greta, and I got a cell phone from my grandson for Christmas, but I can't write any messages because I don't have internet access. Where is it? <laughs> part-time job offer. Looking for part-time cleaners for our car dealership in the industrial district. Need windows of all BMWs cleaned twice weekly. Seeking magicians. The Wizard Card Club is looking for a fifth player. Meeting every Monday at the Wooden Nickel at 6 p.m. Chef. Seeks food lover, will you be my little foodie? I, Jeff, 46, am a passionate chef, and I'm seeking a partner for new culinary uh, adventures. Soccer standings. So this was another part of the bet. doesn't matter anymore because you'd have to win all three, but he, he bet on a 1-0 to zero score between Great Falls and Grass Valley. It was a 0-2 to two score, so that was wrong as well. And an advertisement for the zoo. So we didn't find out what the jackpot numbers were. Um, does anyone remember when the jackpot came in? I think I might have to listen to this again. Just the beginning of it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Friday, February 21st, and... Fine, okay. So... This is Great Falls today. February 21st. Last evening, the famous Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of I'm trying to find out when they announced the lottery. Event. The crown was on exhibit for a several week and gave back of museum meeting going on that foyer with fame. Guest attention, according to eyewitnesses who viewed the tournament. So far, the police have not been standing. The crown was located. I write down, right? So the crown that this was as fool's gold. The unknown yet unclear. Be leaving the museum, it was supposed to have been the magnificent Victor Garfield. Morsel due to the are in Somebody has won the jackpot in the drawing on Wednesday. A ticket with the numbers two, four. Wednesday. So Wednesday was the lottery drawing. Okay. So that's the night before the theft. So that's that's very useful information. We know that it happened before. So if he won the lottery, he's not going to steal that for money. But if he lost it and he was desperate, then maybe so. Okay, good. That's useful information. All right, we've been through all the documents now. Um, it does not feel like we have enough to figure everything out. Um, but now I think we track down that guy. But before we do, let's fill in some stuff here. So we got a picture of her husband that she's marrying from here. So she's to be married, and we know she's having having an affair. I'm saying she's having an affair, but she's really trying to break off the affair, it sounds like. Or tell the person it's no good. But the... Oh, here he is, right here. So this... Sorry, let me show you here. So I'm just filling in some stuff. 
this person who's not named here, we know who that is now. That's the husband to be, the fiance. What was his name again? Victor Garfield. So that's the fiance to Helen. So you, you could imagine drawing a line between these two. Um, all right. We've got someone here who's at who's gambling. Is that going to be our Edgar Dunn? There's his date of birth. Are those the numbers he bet on? Two, four, five, eight. Yep. Look at that. Okay. Look at his date of birth. He said these are the only numbers I ever remember. His birthday is 11 24 1958. Look at the numbers he did 11 2 4 19 5 8. So it sure looks to me like he's this is going to be Edgar Dunn. And we know he's bet super number one from his message. So that, I think this means he won the lottery. It's not necessarily so, right? Because 2-4 could have been, would he have bet 24? Why did he, you know, 5 and 8, why didn't he do, well, maybe 24 is too high a number. Okay, I think he won the lottery is what we're, is what we've got here. And that's definitely Edgar. And photographing is probably going to be Linda, I'm guessing. But we'll come back to that. And this in front of the museum, I'll bet this is going to be Alice. I'll put a question mark here. And then this is going to be our whiskey drinker. Remember, we're told he likes whiskey. The um, patron. So I believe this is going to be Cecil Schubert. I'm going to get to the chat in a second here. Okay, and then that just leaves one other person left over. And I believe that's probably going to be maybe the brother of Dunn. Although, do we have other people? Uh, hmm. So I've got two Duns. I'm going to rip this one up. Okay, Dylan Dunn. I wouldn't be surprised if this is Dylan Dunn who runs this other museum, but that's un unsure. Okay, let's see what we've got in chat. Um... Where was that ribbon guy? Was he mentioned in any documents? Yeah, I don't think he... Like, it's weird. He just got discovered in a room. It's just that they traced uh, room, the room to him. But that all of the evidence we have from him is just because of these two screenshots of stuff in his room. Like, yeah, how did they... How did they catch on to him? Do we have any evidence that made them suspect this guy or suspect this room? I don't think we did. I don't remember ever encountering anything by Frank Ribbon.
Well, here's more. Uh, Frank Ribbon really seems like the. Uh, he's got a lot of mysterious stuff in his room. So, regarding Frank Ribbon, we've got this secret coded message, which we might be able to decrypt. And we've got his path. Uh, uh, escaping that we might be able to track down which I think is what we do now um, he wasn't mentioned in any of the pro uh, I did label Garfield Jonathan here there's Garfield based on his photo we had his name we believe that's Edgar because he's betting and because of his date of birth and Frank Ribbon, or Rippon, I've got down. We don't know why. He's just come out of nowhere. It's odd that we're not introduced to him. That's very odd that the game didn't tell us. Maybe the inspector, uh, maybe the inspector did tell us when he called us back. Let's, um, I think maybe we should listen to the press conference. Thing. But the other thing is, I think if we... We can listen to that second phone call again. Uh, it says, after 50... Sorry, let's look at this. After 50 minutes, he'll call us again. If you want to hear what it is, you can look at the hint, call from Hank. But if we click on go to hints, we might give something away. Um... It's possible, and I'm going to turn this away so you guys don't see it. It's possible that when he gave us our phone call, he told us, let's call from a homie. I don't want to look at the, I don't want to even look at what hints are available. But um, he may have told us that they got wind of some guy that they're tracking. So let's just assume that in that first phone call, or one of those phone calls, he told us how they stumbled upon this guy. Maybe we'll find that out later. Um, and that's how they stumbled on his room. So there's two things we can work on now. We can work on uh, deciphering this, or we can work on his travel. Either one could tell us where he went. So let's see. Um, I guess it's been another hour. Why don't we take another eight minute break and we'll come back. You guys give some thought as to whether you want to try to break this code or track down his location. Jonathan votes for the map puzzle. John says, there's a link for the deaf. You can read the call without the spoilers. Yes, we can definitely read it, but we have to... Oh, let's see. Additional information here. Let's see what we got here. I just don't want this to give away other hints. First call. Okay. Yes, but it does give away a little bit, but let's see. Okay, let's take a look at this second call. He says, I'm out on the beat. I need your help. It looks like Frank Rippon is on the lam. All right, so he doesn't tell us why he's got, why he's so hot interested in Frank Rippon. It would be nice if he did, though. I do appreciate this thing for deaf people. His first call, let's see if he mentions Frank Rippon in his first call. Remember me, it's about a stolen crown. I'm not making any headway. No, nope. okay, so no one has told us how they caught on to Frank Rippon. We're gonna assume they got a tip about a fishy guy in a hotel room and that's what led them to the hotel where they found his room abandoned, etc. Okay, we're gonna take a break. Then we'll uh, come back and we'll start playing with the um, the travel map puzzle. So I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Co-op for Two. And we are going to now try to solve the puzzle of figuring out where Frank Rippon went, which is what our detective called us and asked us <clears throat> to help him with. Let's see what the chat has to say. Frank Rubin committed the crime of buying convoluted amount of transit tickets. We could always make sure we do not miss a URL that relates to ribbons. Um, it is weird that we haven't heard from Frank R that we that we don't see any reference to Frank Ribbons. But I think for now we let's try to solve this. Maybe we'll 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 get something. Um, suspect Frank Rippon seems to have disappeared. Credit card statement requested to track the suspect. Seems to have been escaping in a hurry. Eyewitness indicated they saw the suspect at Naperville Station. Yes, we have established... We have established that he's in room six, Duke of Zell asks. Here's why we have. Because we found the schedule for the hotel. When we looked at room six, we got the information that it's occupied by Frank Rippon, arrived on 719. So yes, that's how we <clears throat> that's how we know Frank Rippon was in this room. So I think that's how we found out his name. It's not exactly clear why we got keyed in to room six, except for this evidence in the hotel room about professional glass cutter. The question is who, who turned us on to the idea of checking room six? But you could imagine a housekeeper might have seen this on the computer and been like, whoa, is this person involved? So somehow someone, someone went in. Okay, so I've printed out the movements here. I should have scanned this in, but... <clears throat> okay, so here's what we think. This is where we think he went. We know at some point he ends up in Naperville. So where is Naperville? Okay, so some at some point he ends up in Naperville. Now, um, if he got on at the hotel. He could have either gotten on, started his journey at his hotel, which was 30 Delmar Place. Where's our map of the city? So let's take a look at this. Um, restaurants, hotels, do we have any subway stations on this map? His hotel was 30 Del Mar Place. His hotel is right there in that green. All right. Now, do we know what train station that would have been nearest? Here's Convention Center, Church Square. It might be nice if we could City Park. There's City Park. Okay, look. Here's City Park. Here's City Park. So it may be... Beachside, Rodello. I'm trying to think. Would his first... Would Naperville have been his first stop where he first got on is that what they're trying to say are they making it that easy 
And well, just for the fun of it, let's let's imagine he got on to Naperville. <laughs> if, for example, here's let's just as an example, if his first stop was at Naperville, then the first thing he did was take a bus. So that would mean he either went for one station, bus ticket for one station. So if that's true, he went from Naperville to City Park, Naperville to Bridge Street, or Naperville to Beachside. So just as, I wish I had, I'm going to, I don't really want to write on this, but I don't. Did I do a printout of this? Sort of, okay. So, <clears throat> if he started at Naperville, then his next stop is either one bus ride to City Park or to Bridge Street or Beachside. Okay, what happens next? He takes a tram. So let's see if a tram rules out any of these places. So there is a tram from City Park. There is a tram from Breach, Beachside, and there is a tram from Bridge Street. Okay, well, if he took a tram from City Park, that puts him in North City or Trevor Crossing. If he took a tram from Beachside, that puts him at Highway 12 or Rodello. And if he took a tram from Bridge Street, that puts, us, puts him in Riverfront, Green Creek, or Holgate Street. Okay. What does he do next? Two stations in one direction in on a metro. So let's see. If he's in North City, he can't catch a metro. Okay, that means he didn't go to North City, and he didn't go to City Park. Or sorry, he could have gone. Okay, he could have gone if he was on. If he went to City Park. His next stops are North City, Trevor Crossing. Neither of those have trams. So he didn't go to Trevor Crossing. He didn't go to North City. He didn't go to City Park. Next up. If he went to Beachside, and then he went to Highway 12, he could have caught a Metro. But if he went to Rodello, he couldn't have. So he couldn't have gone to Rodello. Is it clear what I'm doing here? If he went on his first trip to Bridge Street. He couldn't have gone to Green Creek because there's no metro from there. He couldn't have gone to Holgate. There's no metro there. But he could have gone to Riverfront. Okay. Let me just erase all the places he couldn't have gone. On this map, I wish I had a nice color map, but... Okay, so now he either went to Beachside and then Highway 12, or he went to Bridge Street and then Riverfront. Okay, so he's either in Highway 12 or Ridge Riverfront. By the time he takes a metro, two stations in one direction. So let's see, what does that mean? That means no doubling back. So if he's on Highway 12, and goes two stops, well, lots of possibilities. He could go Overlook and then Postal Headquarters. Maybe we can help ourselves rule out stuff because the next thing he does is bus. Okay, so if he went to Overlook and Postal, there's definitely a bus. If he went to Overlook and Lakeland, there's definitely a bus. If he went to Border Station in Greenbelt, there's a bus. Border Station in Westerly Place, no bus. Okay, if he went to Westerly Place, Border Station, there's a bus. Or Westerly Place and Riverfront, there's a bus. And if he's at Riverfront, he could have gone to Holgate, 
He could have gone to border station. Okay, lots of places he could have gone next. I guess we write them down here. Okay. Um, okay, so if he's at Highway 12 and he takes a metro for two stops, he either ends up in Postal Headquarters or he ends up in Lakeland. Or he ends up in Greenbelt. Or he ends up in Westerly Place. Oh, this is it's not on this map. Because this got overwritten by it. That's annoying. Okay. One, two. You can almost get anywhere on this trip. Okay, but if he started at Riverfront, that puts him either in Border Station or Highway 12. Riverfront, he doesn't have nearly as much choices. I'm almost inclined to assume he went that way just because his choices are limited. Um... Just to be clear, there's no schedule on the brochure. No, there's no time schedule. Okay. Where's... Uh, I see. One very limiting factor is the next one, bike. Once we get to bike, there's very few routes he could be on for bike. That's going to help us. Okay, let's check our bus ticket. I think once we get to bike, our our thing might be easier. So, but now he's got a bus from each of these places. So if he's at border station and he takes a bus, he has to be at North City next. If he's at postal headquarters and takes a bus, he can be at Butcher or Miser Valley. That's step five. If he's on Highway 12 and he takes a bus, he has to be at Holgate. I'm writing, a, I'm writing the number of the step that it is. If he's at Westerly Place, he can't be there because there's no bus leaving there. If he's at Border Station, he goes to North City. If he's at Lakeland, he can go to 6th Street or the city center. Or to Wolfenburg. Postal headquarters, he goes to Butcher or there. Highway 12, he goes to Holgate. Okay. So now we're, there aren't that many places he can be at this step. I believe I've looked at all of them. Hmm. Yes, I believe I've looked at all of them. Okay, so now he takes a bike. Now, there aren't that many places to take a bike. If he's at Butcher, he can't take a bike. So he can't be there. Okay, if he's at Miser Valley, he can't take a bike. So he can't be there. If he's at Holgate, he can't take a bike, so he can't be there. If he's at 6th Street, he can take a bike. If he's at 6th Street, he can take a bike to the mall or a bike to St. Urbanus. If he's at the city center, he can't take a bike, so he can't be there. If it, he's at North City, he can't take a bike, so he can't be there. That puts him in only two places now. At the mall or at St. Urbanus? Now he's only at two possible places. Assuming he started from Naperville. 
Dana Bennis from the mall. Unless I'm missing out on something, I think that's right. It's only this is the only route he could have gone. Now, a uh, question I have is: Are we send the suspect to the uh, send the suspect location? So one question I'm not entirely sure about is. Are we trying, are we supposed to send him to the final location or each step of the way? It says he wants to question on other passengers on the way to Naperville. So I'm not sure whether we're supposed to say... Send the suspect location to the lead investigator by clicking on it. Then the pursuit will begin. Avoid incorrect information. Final look. Jonathan says, I read it. Answer that it wants is our final location. Okay, let's continue this. Let's make, let's make sure we have a unique. Let's see if we can find a unique location. Right now, I've got him in only two possible locations after the bike ride. Okay, so now he takes a tram. So he's either at the mall, in which case a tram is a dotted line, could bring him to Warden Mill, Greenbelt, Warden Mill or Greenbelt if he's at the mall. If he's at St. Urbana, Urbanus, there's no, yeah, sorry, there is a tram to Gemetry. So now three places he could be after he takes one tram. Now he takes a bus from these three locations. Okay, the bus is green. So if he's at Green Belt, there's only one bus. It goes to Hunter Way. If he's at Warden Mill, there's only one bus. Sorry. If he's at Warden Mill, there's only one bus. It goes... Is Gemetry. If he's at Gemetry, there's only one bus that goes to Warden Mill. So he's at two places. Warden Mill, he ends up in Gemetry. If he's at Gemetry, he ends up in Warden Mill. I guess there were three places. And if he's at Green Belt, he ends up in Hunter's Way. So Hunter's Way... Warden Mill or Gemetry we have after his bus. And now he takes a city bike. Okay, so let's see. If he's at Hunter Way, there's no city bike, so he can't be there. If he's at Warden Mill, there's no city bike, so he can't be there. If he's at Gemetry, there's one bike, and it goes to Northgate, so that's where he is. That's my calculation, that he has to be at Northgate. Is that clear? Obviously, it's hard to follow, but is it clear what I did? I assumed he started in Naperville and took a bus. So I wrote one in Naperville for the first step of his trip was at one. And then I said all the bus tickets from Naperville would be our possible step twos. And then so on and so on. So Northgate is what I get. And it's comforting that there's only one way there. Now, if it asked us to do his path, we would go backwards. We'd go 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So presumably he got like this. 3 and 4. And five or so, something like that. It's hard. I have to. I'd have to retrace that. But let's see if um, let's see if giving it the final location makes it happy. If I'm right, so I'm going to click on Northgate here. 
Duke of Zill says, can I ask how you changed from being at 6th Street on the second to last step to the cemetery? The geometry. Okay, let's see. 6th Street I have as our fifth stop. So let's see. Let me understand the question. Can I ask how you changed from being at 6th Street on the second to last stop to geometry? Okay, so 6th Street wasn't the second to last stop. 6th Street was step five. And then he took a tram from 6th Street. I don't think we got from 6th Street to Gemetry. We got from 6th Street. Well, it's a little hard to back up from it. Um, We had him either at 6th Street or at the city center, right? And then we had him, I think, I can't remember if it's bus ticket or city ticket. City bike from 6th Street to Urbanus. So 6th Street to Urbanus by City Bike or to the mall. That's what it is. 6th Street was step five. Let's look. 6th Street was step five. Yeah, 6th Street just before the bike. That's right. Okay, so let's do it. So he's 6th Street. He takes a bike. So that can put him at Urbanus, which is six. Or at the mall, which is six, right? Let's make sure this is clear. This is Urbanus is six. Okay, so 6th Street, he could either bike to Urbanus or bike to the mall. And was there another five that was valid? Yes. Uh, well, I see a couple other fives, North City, but let's assume that this was the right one. Okay, so then the next one was a tram. So a tram from St. Urbanus gets us to Geometry. Or a tram from the mall doesn't work. So that gets us to Geometry at step seven. Then a bus ticket from Geometry would get us to Warden Mill. That doesn't work. Did I skip a step? Well, now you got me second guessing it. Bike to the mall or St. Urbanus, is that what we did? Oh, I hate to do it all over again. I'd have to print it out again. Duke of Zill says, my mistake. I thought there was only one bike trip. There's two bike trips. At the very end, there's a bike trip. All right, let's try my guess. If it's wrong, we'll have to back up and do it again. Let's try it. So I'm going to click Northgate on the tab on and see what happens. Inspector's on the move. Wait for his new position. Bullseye. I just caught Frank Rippon as he was boarding the tram car. He was interrogated on the spot and taken into custody. He has also been interrogated. What happened here? Why did it close that on its own? He has also been interrogated with John Olson. You can access both interrogations here on the police server. Okay, so I got it. I figured it out. Uh, it was a little confusing. It would have been easier if I could draw on this map. But it would be fairly easy to show the exact path. It was, a, I'm kind of curious what would happen if we had just moved him one step along or given the wrong answer. Maybe when we're done, we'll come back here and see if we can play with it and see what it, what it shows you when you're wrong. 
But that was kind of cool, although I, I really would have liked a better explanation for if they want the final place. And this idea that he was sighted at Naperville should not have made us so sure that that was his first trip. I guess from the map of the city, we knew that that was fairly close to where he was. So maybe if this is a larger area, it would make sense that that would be his first stop. Okay, but we got it right, and now we're allowed to access both locations. Okay, so it's added two more recordings for us to listen to. Are you ready to listen to them? All right, here we go. Let me know if you can hear them okay. Log of the interrogation of Mr. John Olson. Inspector Jason Mahoney and Mr. John Olson are present. Mr. Olson, you work as a journalist at the Great Falls Tribune. You were working in that capacity on the night of February 20th during the museum night event. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Please explain what you did that evening. I started at the Museum of Art and Culture at 11.30 p.m. I talked to Dunn, the museum director, for around 10 minutes, then took some pictures of the exhibits. Around 1 a.m., I left for the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. Did you meet anyone on your way to the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts? Well, the city was full of people. Actually, though, I took a couple of side streets. I live close by, so I'm familiar with the area. I didn't meet anyone. Although, yes, there was one man who met me halfway. He looked me over like he knew me, but we didn't speak. Then I just continued to the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. What time did you reach the Upstate New York Museum? Well, it was around 1.25, I'd say. And what did you do in the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts? Well, I did my job. My colleague, Leona Lamb, had asked me an hour earlier to take some pictures at the Upstate New York Museum, and she gave me her camera. I talked to Alice Fuller, the museum director, not a very nice woman, let me tell you, for a minute in the museum. Then I left around 2 a.m. to head home. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. At the moment, we have no further questions for you. He took a photo with her camera? He says he took a photo of her camera and weaves it to him. Does that mean... Does that mean that photo is... Photo from Leona Lamb's camera. Oh, fine arts. Okay, so this isn't Leona's alibi. This is not Leona's alibi. It's John Olson's alibi. Because he said he's doing what Leona said. Leona or Linda? So, so actually we need, we need to say it's his alibi photo and not her alibi photo, right? Yes, Duke of Zill says, Lamb's alibi is now Olsen's alibi. Yes, I believe that's right. So alibi. And let's take the alibi off Leona Lamb. Okay. Okay, and he also says that he met someone halfway who looked him over. He said he took some side streets. I'm not sure we know where he lives, but he took some side streets and he met someone halfway. And he said, um, I wrote down his timeline here. He said he left Arts and Culture at 1130, 10 minutes, at, at 1130, 10 minutes he talks to Dunn, so we know Dunn is there. At 1 a.m. he goes to the other gallery where his alibi is, he arrives at 125, and halfway there he met someone. So it took him 25 minutes to get to the new place, and he met someone halfway. That person could be going to the place where the crown is. All right, let's listen to, could you guys hear that okay? Let's listen to Rippon's interrogation. This is the important one, four minutes long. Log of the interrogation of 
Mr. Frank Rippon. Inspector Jason Mahoney and Mr. Frank Rippon are present. Mr. Rippon, you are suspected of stealing the Midnight Crown from the Museum of Art and Culture. That's not true. I didn't steal the crown. Mr. Rippon, we found a map on the hotel computer in your room showing the way from your hotel to the museum. We also found an order overview there from an online shop for a glass cutter. You also tried to escape when we apprehended you at the Northgate station. Admit it. You're just making things harder on yourself. I didn't steal the crown. Mr. Rippon, I've had enough of you. Fuck, damn it. If you confess now, I promise that I will do everything in my power to get your sentence reduced. But you have to say something, Mr. Rippon. <sighs> okay. I admit that I wanted to steal it. I went to the Museum of Art and Culture during the museum night event, and I was planning on stealing the crown, but when I got there, it was already gone. It was just gone. I got out of there right away and went straight to Great Falls. Someone must have gotten there first. I swear it. I didn't steal the crown. You have to believe me. Am I understanding you correctly? You wanted to steal the crown, but when you got to the museum... Somebody else had already stolen it? Yes, that's it. I swear. Please, you have to believe me. When did you go to the Museum of Art and Culture? It must have been around 1.20 a.m. Yeah, that's, that's around when I left the hotel. Can anyone confirm that? I have no idea whether anyone can confirm that. I didn't talk to anyone. Oh, wait. Yes, there was someone. On the way to the Museum of Art and Culture, I met this one journalist in the rear courtyard. I just read an article recently that there was a big photo of him printed on it. And what was his name? Uh, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, I've almost got it. Olson. Yeah, that was it. John Olson. Okay, all right. Let's say I believe you, and you really did want to steal the crown. But someone got there before you did. Did you want to steal the crown yourself? Or were you working for someone else? Not for me. What would I do with a crown like that? I was supposed to steal it for a client. And before you ask me his name, I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. He was going to tell me who he was when I told him I had stolen the crown once I'd gone into hiding and I didn't have the police on my heels. I never met him. We only communicated via text message. You communicated with him via text message? On your cell phone? Yes, I did. He always had a different number, and he sent them to me in all kinds of different ways. Like I said, we agreed I would contact him, give him a secret code, and we would agree to a handoff location once I had stolen the Midnight Crown. But I didn't steal it. The crown really was gone already when I got to the museum. That's very interesting, isn't it? What was the last number you used to communicate with the client? Can you even be certain he's a man? Good question. Somehow I just assumed it was a guy. But no, I can't be certain of it. Now hang on. I wrote down his number. It's a uh, plus one eight six two three four three nine eight zero two. Mr. Rippon, you're going to make me tear it out of you. What was the secret code word you were going to give the client for the handover location on? Text message? The code word was safe cracker. Yeah, I usually communicated with him via text message. That's what I was going to carry it out to two, three, uh, plus one, eight, six, two, three, four, three, nine, eight, zero, two. Mr. Rippon, you're going to make me tear it out of you. What was the secret code word you were going to give the client for the handover location on? Text message? The code word was safe cracker. Yeah, I usually communicated with him via text message, but I really don't know anything else. Like I said, I couldn't steal the crown, so I never contacted him afterwards. Interesting. I'll be giving this information directly to our team of special investigators. At the moment, we have no further questions for you. Well, since I'm sending you the interrogation, dear private investigators, I sent you an envelope in the mail with some additional information we have collected. Did you get it already? Yes. Please make sure you look at the envelope. Okay. All right, so we've entered phase two, chapter two, act two. All right, so what do you guys think of his, what his answer? He said he went to steal it. He was going to steal it. He was stealing it for a client. 
He tells us that he ran into John Olson, which is why John Olson was interviewed as well. He says he left his hotel at 120. We know it takes him 18 minutes to walk based on his map. So that would have gotten him there at 138, at which point we know the, the crown was already stolen. So his alibi, he sounds pretty reasonable. Um, I, I, Jonathan says, I will say it seems weird that he was with the journalist and now the journalist is his alibi. Did they get picked up together, right? They did get picked up together, right? No, that's not how I'm reading it. I'm reading it as a little um, confusing, but I the way I'm thinking about it is they picked up Frank Rippon, they caught him, they interrogated him, he mentioned Olson, and then we went and picked up Olson. So I think we should be thinking of it like first they pick up Rippon, he names Olson as his alibi, then we picked up Olson. This should have been these would be better off in a different order. But I don't believe we're picking we picked them up together, no. Um and Olson has a rock solid alibi. It is weird that they're mentioning, but I think that's the way to read it. They're so they they are each other's alibi, but they don't need each other's alibi because um we've got Olson's alibi in the photo. And Olson's timeline makes sense too that he would run into our guy Rep Rippin on the way. So I think Rippin is um, is th saying the truth. We've got this document now that we can open, and I will notice that this sheet that we found. We thought this code word might be for decrypting this, but it's not. He's saying this code word is so he can identify the person once he talks to them. So I think we don't need this yet. And I think we've got two things to do. We've got this envelope and then we've got a phone number to call. We don't know what this encryption thing is yet. And I don't think we now crack it with this. Although it's a little unclear, but it sounded like they were gonna exchange this. But um, let's worry about this later when we get stuck, since I'm not sure we're supposed to decrypt it. We've got two things we could do now. We can call this number or open this envelope. What should we do first? John says, I think your reading makes sense, but can we go back and read the message after the map puzzle to see how it was phrased? Yes, let's see. So there's two things we can do this and we can listen to Olson's interview. So if we go to this, oh, it doesn't want to give it to me anymore. Okay, here we go. So if we go to here, we talked to him. He says, I just caught Frank Rippon as he was boarding the tram car. He was interrogated on the spot and has been taken into custody. He has also been interrogated with John Olson. Yeah, so this is, again, a little language translation problem. But I think basically we caught him, we interrogated him, and now it's saying we also brought in John Olson to get his answer to see if the alibi checks out with him. That's how I read it. I think that makes sense. And then if we, we could try listening to Olson's again to see. Log of the interrogation of Mr. John Olson. Inspector Jason Mahoney and Mr. John Olson are present. Mr. Olson, you work as a journalist at the Great Falls Tribune. Yeah, we're just getting We're're background from him. Capacity on the night of February 20th during the museum night event. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Please explain what you did that evening. Yeah, so we, we picked up Rippin. We're like, we caught you. He gives us as his alibi that he happens to run into this journalist. So we're like, bring in the journalist. Let's question him. Let's see if he's wrapped up in this. If he's a solid alibi, what? So that's that's the that's the John Olson connection. All right. Um, 
Duke of Zill says, I vote call first, whichever was mentioned first in the interrogation. I don't know what was mentioned in the interrogation, but let's call. Where'd my phone go? Oh, okay, here we go. We're calling the number that Frank Rippon memorized. number you have dialed is not in service. Please check the number and dial again. Or dial 611 for customer assistance. Hmm. Message DN204CO53. And that's a phone number in New Jersey. That's a little odd. Did I write it down wrong? Or is that an encrypted phone number? Or... It doesn't match any of the other numbers, does it? Well, that's curious. Do I need to listen to that again? Let's listen to it again, make sure I got Welcome it right. The interrogation of Mr. Funny Theater, Miss Hotel Computer in the Museum from an on North Gate station. He says he contacts him, he sends him in different ways, and he always has a different number. So I think it is part of the game that this number is no longer valid, but maybe the encrypted thing is a new number. Would agree to a handoff Let's see. Once I had stolen the midnight crown. But I didn't steal it. The crown really was gone already when I got to the museum. That's very interesting, isn't it? What was the last number you used to communicate with the client? Can you even be certain he's a man? Good question. Somehow I just assumed it was a guy. But no, I can't be certain of it. Now hang on. I wrote down his number. It's a uh, plus one eight six two three four three nine eight zero two. Mr. Rippon, you're going to make me tear it out of you. Okay, so we wrote down the right number. When we called it, it said it's out of service, but it was a phone number in New Jersey for what it's worth. So I think that's part of the game. That was everything happened as it should have been. His number is no longer valid. Um, maybe after all this happened, he changed his number, disappeared. I'm not sure we're all, re we're not sure we're supposed to get it. Maybe text the code word to the number. That's a very clever idea. Okay, let's try it. That's a very interesting idea. I was thinking maybe we should text it, but I never, Consider the idea of texting the, I never thought of texting the code name. All right, let's try it. So I'm going to say one, I'm going to type in the number. Okay, we're texting with it. Now I'm going to type in safe cracker. I'm going to show you this so you can see it. Let's see what happens. Oh my God, you got it. 
Well done. Well done, Jonathan. Well done. Look at that. Very clever. Well done, Jonathan. He says it very again, very clear. You communicate with him, text with. Okay, so I'm assuming you can see that. I'll give you a close up if you didn't. So look what he says. You can't be serious. Contacting me right now. The handover will be here in one hour. Handover will be here in one hour. Decryption key. So he's given us a decryption key. Five, 11, 15, 19, 24, 28, 34, 40, 45, 50, 51, 54, 59, 61, 64. He says, remember the notes you took and used them. I'm not wearing glasses. I don't have a beard and my hair is gray and white. I'm wearing a button up and a blazer. Hmm. Um, so this is Mr. X. Let's see. No glasses. I'm just going to write this down so we don't have to go back to it. No glasses. No beard. Gray and white hair. Button up blazer. No glasses, no beard, gray and white hair, button up blazer. So that is either Dylan Dunn or Cecil. Both of them seem like they would fit that description if we're to believe. Either this guy fits it or this guy fits it. Sorry. Either Dylan Dunn fits it or Cecil Schubert fits it. But why do we even suspect this person if he didn't steal it? John says, I guess we can decrypt the code now before opening the envelope. Um, I believe we can decrypt the code now. Do you guys know how to decrypt the code? I can make a guess. Duke of Zill says, I think I know this cipher. Okay, let's hear what you think, Duke of Zill. I think I'm guessing too. I have a guess. The thing is, I don't know why this guy would be... We know this guy wants it stolen, but we don't really think he did steal it, do we? This is going to be a way to eliminate a guy. Once we figure out who this is, we'll be, have eliminated him. Because he thinks... That we have it. All right, Duke of Zill, what's your guess? Jonathan, you want to guess how to decrypt? Each number is how many letters you count. Yes, that was my guess too. One, two, three, four, five. We've got five rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 14 in the first four. So five times 14 is 70, which is enough in this range that it sounds right to me. So let's see if we can't make this a little easier on ourselves. So yes, it seems to me like it's counting numbers. Okay, so this row starts at one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. This row starts at 15. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. This one starts at 29. 29, 30, 31, 32, 
Aaron's 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43. This one starts at 44. Is that right? It's different numbers in each thing. 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 53, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This would be 58, if that's right. 29, 30. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Okay, let's see. So, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is an S. 11, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11 is a C. 15 we see is an A. 19, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 is a C. 24 is 28, 27, 26, 25, 24. 28 is an O. It's going to be a station, isn't it? 34 is 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Station. 40 is 43, 42, 41, 40. B. 45 is an A. B, A. 57, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. That's C. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 8. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. 59 is an O. 58, 59, 60, 61. 60, 58, 59, 60, 61, 60, 60. Station bathroom. Station bathroom is what it says. But we don't know what station bathroom. The handover will be here in one hour. Remember the notes you took and use them. So remember the notes you took and use them is telling us to use this information, this code to figure out where. Well, we know the station in city center is Napier station. That's where our guy got into the train station. So that would make sense. All right, well, let's open up this envelope and see if see if that helps us. Could use some paper clips. Was he picked up at a station? Could he have been there waiting? He was, yes, I mean, no. He wasn't picked up at his station. He took a he took a bike. Well, let's see. Where did we say he went? The north gate. Let's take a look. So if he's lying, and he went to north gate, what's where we found him? So north gate station. So if he's lying and he really did have the crown, then it would. He handed it over at the Northgate Station bathroom, and he's already gotten rid of it. Remember, we picked him up. He didn't have it on him. So maybe he just handed it over. But somehow I feel like, well, I love that texting a message to that number worked. All right, I think, I mean, it. it's possible he did do it, but I think his alibi checks out. I think he couldn't have gotten there in time. Although I'm not, I'm not positive. Um, Duco still reminds me of something. If he's on, if he's at Northgate, Northgate, you can't get a metro from Northgate, just a tram. But is it still considered a station? I'm not sure. 
but I am sure that we don't have to worry about it yet. Let's see what's in this envelope first. All right, so this is after we're, we've picked up our guy. Now we're gonna open this envelope and see. I'm a little uh, curious what's in here. Like we've interviewed the guy, we've got his stuff. What's gonna be in here? Let's put this out of the way. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's a whole set of Act Two clues. So what? Where was all this found? Oh, couple up. Good. Now we're gonna find out who. What do you think? Like, how do we get this information that's in this envelope? What did it say when it gave it to us? It just told us like. Since I'm sending you the interrogation, dear private investigators, I sent you an envelope in the mail with some additional information we have collected. Did you get it already? Just some additional information they've collected. Okay. So they followed up on Couple Up, Ready to Find True Love, and we've got a website. Check the website. Every two minutes, a new couple finds one another on Couple Up. Okay, so that's cool. We're going to check that couple website. What else have we got? Huh. Some. Some dictionary words. I wonder if this is just, it's got an entry for fool's gold. The phrase fool's gold refers to pyrite, a worthless mineral that resembles gold. This feels like it might just be in case we missed that someone said fool's gold. Who who said fool's gold to us? Was it in the social media page? Or no, it was in the dating, wasn't it? It was in the dating app. I have a feeling that this is just in case you don't know the term that was used in that dating app comment to help you avoid missing, making that connection. Remember the dating app, he says, um, well, no, actually he says, all that glitters is not gold, mark my word. All right, let's see, anything else here that seems relevant with us? To me, this just seems like it's just to help you in case you don't understand the language completely. I don't think it's significant, but you let me know. It was also mentioned in, during the press briefing at the start. Yes, okay. And then we've got something torn up from the newspaper. Five seventeen two 2018 Criminal apprehended. This is old from the archive. Yesterday evening, a criminal was apprehended in Heartland near Great Falls. He was arrested for counterfeiting ID cards and for involvement in various identity theft crimes. The police sur surrounded and entered the suspect's residence at around 7 p.m. A variety of counterfeit ID documents were found. A neighbor reported the man after becoming suspicious that he was involved in criminal activity. Found in a trash can at the Great Falls. Falls Central Library. Whoa, look at this. That's pretty cool. So the newspaper has taken photos of all the fake IDs that this person made up. And there's two pages of them. What do we make of this? Very interesting. Let's see. 
So someone printed out the archives of someone who made these fake IDs. So the question is, do any of these people match the names, dates, or fingerprints of any of our people? Let's see what we got here. So, um, well, let's start from here. Lawrence Eirich. Pablo Augusto, Mike, surname. They've crossed off actually the names. They've crossed off the names of the people. Just their first name we have. Hmm. Well, Charlie was the person on the website. Maybe we go to the website and that will point us to someone. I don't see anyone named Charlie at the moment. And I don't see any fingerprints. Ray. Georgios. Is he making IDs for people? Says not to be published. All right, well, let's go on the website. Um, there are wedding ring links on some IDs. Wedding ring links? What does that mean? I mean, some might say they're married. What's a wedding ring link? What do you mean, wedding ring link? Here? Is that what you're saying? Does that mean they're married? That's interesting. Hmm. I see what you're saying. I just don't know how to use that, but that's very observant. This looks like the same person here and here. And here, so three of these people are the same. Georgios, Fyodor, Mike. Three September 85, no birth date. Different birth date. This one guy's all over the place. Using different dates of birth, too. Marriage sign, marriage sign, marriage sign. Oh, you guess what? They're all... The, the ones that are all the same are the ones with the marriage thing. Like marriage, marriage mark, rings, rings, rings. These are all the same person. So that double circle, whether it's marriage or not, it is all for this one person. That's quite telling. That seems like that's our guy who's caught. All right. Well, let's see if we can't uh, track him down in the... Let's see if he's not in the dating site or something. Could any of the photos match those on the poster? Let's see. This is in 2018, so this was just... Uh, Two years ago. Is that a picture of Frank Rippon? I think it is. There's only one person who's not, we don't see their face, and that's Ed, El, Edgar. Very curious. All right, let's go on the dating site since we don't we haven't been done that yet, and let's see if that doesn't open up some ideas for us. Yeah. 
a con man. It definitely is a con man. What's oh Victor Garfield? Oh, that's <laughs> Jonathan might be right. That's Victor Garfield. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, good work. All right, Jonathan has come through. Okay, so yes, you're right. That's Victor Garfield. Jonathan is right. That's Victor Garfield, who the guy on the dating site was trying to warn her about. The Duke of Zill says, when you first looked at the torn document, it says married with the linked rings. Oh. Well done. Married. Okay. Good. Okay. So, the picture is starting to fill out now. The young Victor Garfield is a con man. He's set to marry into, marry into this rich family. Uh, Helen is having an affair or ha has a past flame who's discovered now that Victor Garfield is a con man and he's already married. So he is going to reveal to her so I, I wonder if the answer is that the old flame confronted Victor and said, I'm about to turn you, I'm going to tell her and you're going to be kicked out, cancel the wedding, and maybe Victor grabbed the crown and left. So let's see if we can figure out who, who Charlie is that's having an affair with Helen, or not having an affair, is an old flame. I can't tell if they're having an affair. Okay, very smart, Jonathan. It is Victor Garfield. He just changed his hairstyle to cover up. All right, let's go to the website. www.upfall. Got some teamwork going today. Coupleupnow.com. Okay. Couple up. You're not alone. Meet lesbian women near you. Oh, lesbian. Is it all lesbians? Meet up in real life. You can click on this. Find yourself. Discover your. Couple up showed me who I really am. My partner and I met in the chat room, and I'm so unbelievably grateful for this platform from Sarah. Meet women like you. Yep. Okay. So, it's a woman. Helen is having an affair of an old flame with a woman. It's very discreet, but I guess if we look at it, it looks like two women's hands. Okay. So, I wonder if that's all we're going to get from this page. Let's see, what if we click, you're not alone? Or is this just a header? Couple up. I don't think there's anything to click here. I think we're just meant to be given this clue that it's a woman. There's a header here we can click, but it just goes to, it's just a header page. Discover our chat room. Meet women like you. This kind of looks like maybe, I mean, I'm a little concerned that it's not working. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing you. Sorry. So here's the website. Charlie is a girl. Yes, Charlie is a girl. So if you go to the website... There's nothing to click on. It says, discover our chat room, mate women like you. There's one clickable area, but it's just this uh, top banner. And when we click on it, it just goes to the index. Nothing really to click on. It almost makes me concerned that something's wrong. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the front and bring up another different browser just in case. Always used to browse through browsers. I think we're just supposed to gather that it's a woman. I think that's the only clue we're getting. 
So here is with a different browser. Yeah, there's nothing to click on here. Okay. John says, what's the imprint button? The imprint is um, on all these websites and it just tells us that it's the company hidden in hidden games. It's 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 like a required law that they say who owns this website, whatever. It's probably some German law. Um but yeah, okay, so there's nothing to do here but know that it's a woman. All right, so what do we know? We know that Victor Garfield was a con man. He was arrested in 2018 and that he's married. At least he was married in 2018. And now he's going under a different name. Presumably he was going to get married to Helen, Helena. And, oh, can I point out, we do know one woman who works at the newspaper. Right? That's going to be Alice. So probably Alice is Charlie, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Alice or Le Leanna or Linda. Uh, oh, sorry. Alice is not the uh, newspaper. Linda is the newspaper. And Linda was the person that we thought had an alibi with her photo, but she doesn't. And... It is kind of curious that she instructed um, John Olson to go take photos with her camera at a good alibi location. Like she's trying to create an alibi for herself. So yeah, it's going to be Linda. But here's the challenge I have for you. So let's think about this for a second. Robert, so Jesse, at the start of the chat, I said I looked over all the material and then got stuck. I am now caught up with your stream. All right. <clears throat> so here's the dilemma we have. I think we we understand a, most of this case, except we've got a bit of a dilemma. We know a Mr. X who never speaks on the phone, only through text, contacted Frank Rippon and hired, not as another alibi, I think she hired Frank to steal the crown. Maybe so that the wedding would be called off or delayed. The thing is that Charlie, sorry, do we know that Charlie is Mr. X? No, we don't. Mr. X could very well be our... Hmm, yeah, okay. That's a little confusing. All right, let, let's... Sorry. Let's back up a little bit. Let me, let's talk about what we think we know. Helena is marry, going to marry the con artist. Helena has an ex-flame, which is a woman who we think has access to the archive not for public information in the newspaper. So we think that's Linda, who works at the newspaper. So I believe Linda is Charlie. Linda has found out information about Victor Garfield. Right, here's Linda, who works at the newspaper, photographer. She's found out, and here's Helena go, going to marry Victor. So Linda's trying to get back together with Helena. She's messaging Helena through the lesbian dating site saying, I found out about Victor. It's a very important that, I, that you answer me. You can't marry him. It's fool's gold, whatever. Okay. So Linda... 
So here's the part that's confusing. Someone hires Frank Rippon to steal the crown. And they've been talking for quite some time. We know that because the hotel purchase of the glass cutting stuff was quite early, weeks before the actual theft. So, like, they've been planning this theft since February, 3rd, February 8th. That's when the order came in. So someone's planning on stealing that crown since February 8th, maybe Victor Garfield. So now my guess, best get is, guess is that Victor Garfield is hiring Frank Rapone to steal the crown, but that Linda is trying to warn Helena that Victor is a con man. So the thing that's still a little confusing is we know that the person who hired Frank Rapone is a Mr. X, right? So there's two possibilities. Either Mr. X is Linda or Mr. X is Victor. However, you so either Victor is hiring Rapone to steal it so he can get the crown or Linda's hiring Victor, Linda's hiring Frank Rapone to steal it so that she can delay the wedding. Now, if you think about those options, it gets a little confusing because we know that the theft is being planned all the way at February 8th. February 8th, is where she hears the date they're getting married. So if Victor is the one hiring, and we don't think Frank got, okay, there's two possibilities. Yes, the, the announcement for the wedding was yes. There's two, there's two possibilities for who Mr. X is. It's either Victor or Linda. And then there's two possibilities for the theft of the crown, or more than two. One is that Frank Rapone is lying to us. About having stolen it. I don't think that's true. I think the fact that we text messages this person on the 25th of February, and he's saying, like, do you have it? So that means Mr. X didn't get it. And it means Frank Rapone didn't steal it. And we can believe his alibi. So that means someone else stole it. So, and not Mr. X, not whoever was planning it. So that still could be either Victor Garfield or Linda, whoever's not Mr. X, whoever's, and we don't know if Charlie is Mr. X, so I'm inclined to believe not, although I don't know. And then it could be someone completely independently trying to steal it. But if we believe some of the stuff we believe, let's go over this, then we'll come back to this. Okay. Let's look at our suspects. Edgar Dunn, we think, won the lottery the day before, so he wouldn't steal it. Dylan Dunn looked like a good suspect, but he already told us, told his brother, he's not going to steal it unless it's insured, and he got a letter saying it's not insured. So that gets rid of him. He won the lottery, so he wouldn't have stole it. It's not insured, so he wouldn't have stole it. Helena, surely she's not stealing her own crown. John Olson has a good alibi. He's taking the photo at that time using Linda's uh, camera. Al 
Alice should be working at her museum herself, so I don't think she's going to do it. Linda is going to be Charlie, the old flame of Helen. Charlie to Helen. Um, she's our best guess. And Cecil, we think, didn't do it and has an alibi. So Alice, Linda, I guess it it couldn't be Alice because only Linda would have access to this information. So I'm guessing it's Linda, not Alice. But that doesn't mean Alice didn't steal it for totally independent reasons. Um, okay, let's look at let's go to the chat for a bit now. <clears throat> I think Linda found out about Garfield, so the last message from the... Uh, so I don't think Linda is X. I think... I don't think Linda found out about Garfield until the last message. So if we look at their talks, the last message is not until the day of the robbery and... Charlie says, I need to talk to you right away. What I have to tell you is going to completely change your decision. It's really very important. Please respond. You're heading for disaster. She says, I'm at a total loss. In two days, you're going to make the biggest mistake of your life. I can't save or stop you. All that glitters is not gold. Mark my words. Um... So, what Jonathan's saying is what I agree with. Like, Linda may have stolen it, but she can't be Mr. X because Mr. X has been planning this since February 8th at the latest. Although February 8th is when she found out, but it make that's too early. Like, yeah, she wouldn't. So I think Victor or someone else is Mr. X hiring, but I think it's going to be likely, don't you, that... Charlie is Linda, and Linda stole it in desperation to, to, to halt the wedding before Mr. X could get it, is what I think. Like, she thought that's the only way she could stop the wedding. I'm not sure why you would think that would necessarily stop the wedding. Was Linda in the initial press conference? Did we hear her speak on this? Okay, it's good. That's a. It's good. It's time to go back to the initial press conference and see if we can hear anything. Hear that press conference again, and then Jonathan says, "I think we need to review the actual questions the game wants." Yes. Okay. So let's do this. Let's listen to the press conference that we only listened to once. Then let's walk through our evidence, and then let's look at the questions just to make sure there isn't any evidence that we forgot to write down station bathroom. Okay, let's listen to the uh, press conference again. Jason Mahoney from the New Haven Police Force, who is heading up the case, will now take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much that so many of you have joined us today. As you all know, yesterday evening, the Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and Culture in Great Falls during the Museum Night event. Based on our initial findings, it appears the perpetrators removed the crown from the rear exhibition hall, where it was located in a freestanding glass display case. According to witness statements, we currently believe that the theft took place between 1 and 3 a.m. It is not possible to narrow down the time any more than that at the moment, since we do not have access to surveillance footage for the Museum of Art and Culture. We request that all visitors who were in the museum during the time in question that evening and who may have relevant information contact our police department. I'm now available to take questions from the audience. Yes, the woman all the way in the back, please. Why don't you have any surveillance footage? According to the security company responsible for surveillance, 
there was a technical defect on that evening, causing most of the recordings to be lost. We are currently attempting to restore at least some of the material. However, it is unclear whether we will be successful. The woman in the fourth row, second from the right, please. Do you believe the technical defect was a coincidence, or that it may have had something to do with the fact? We are not making any speculations. We do not currently know whether the technical defect and the theft are related. However, we are still investigating the issue. The man here in the front with the gray hair and the blazer, please. Yes. Okay, great. Well, hello, my name is Cecil Schubert. Some of you here might know me. I, I am a supporter of the arts and an art collector. As a representative of the Great Falls Collectors Society, uh, I was wondering whether the police have any information on where the crown is now. No, Mr. Schubert. As I said, we don't know anything yet about the crown's whereabouts. I just want to point out, Cecil Schubert, the art collector, describes himself as, is described as gray hair with a blazer. And remember, our Mr. X says, here's how you notice me. No glasses, no beard, gray and white hair, and a button-up blazer. So, gray and white hair does not sound like Victor Garfield for Mr. X. So, it feels like Cecil Schubert, the art collector may be our Mr. X, who's been planning this for a long time, and has arranged for it to be at that museum, which he knows very well, since he works with all the museums, and he probably knows that the security is not good, and that the glass cases are bad there. So, I think we might have found our Mr. X. Unfortunately, we cannot make any statements at this time. Yes, Miss Lamb from the Great Falls Tribune, please. The crown was supposed to be worn tomorrow evening during Helena Havemeyer and Victor Garfield's wedding. Sources say the wedding has been canceled due to the incident. Do you have any more information? Yes, the crown was owned by the Havemeyer family and was supposed to be worn by Helena Havemeyer, as the family tradition has been for many years. The wedding has been canceled. However, this is not relevant to the case at this time. Thank you all for coming today. Please excuse this brief press conference, but right now we need all the resources we can muster to investigate the disappearance of the Midnight Crown. We thank you for your understanding. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for taking part in the press conference. Please make sure you don't leave anything behind in the hall. So I tried to listen to the whispers, and uh, there doesn't seem to be anything important. Duke of Zil says she wants to know for sure that it's canceled. Aw, oh, yeah, I think you're. that's an interesting, that's a good take. That Like, Linda is like, I just want to make sure the wedding's canceled. Um, okay. And Jonathan says it makes sense to me that Cecil is Mr. X. It would make complete sense that he's the one who would orchestrate it being delivered at that museum where he could steal it. And that's why you could be planning it way in advance, knowing where it would be. All right, let's let's go over all of our documents again and see if we've missed anything. We'll start with, we'll go from back to front here. So we've got the public transit map. We know that's for tracking down Frank Rippon's route. So we... We've got that. The couples brochure, couple up, we believe was just to give us the hint that the X flame is another woman. We've got this, which feels to me like it's just to give people a hint that might not know this expression, what it means. There actually looks like there's almost like a fingerprint on there, right there. But uh, if so, it's not clear enough to use. So I don't know what this is about. I, I don't really understand it. I'm just thinking it's a game hint for people who might not know some expressions. Like in every version they print of the game, they say, okay, if there's some terms of art that's used, let's... Let's list them, some of them here so people don't get stuck not understanding. Okay, then we've got this, 
which we believe was showing us this this clue with these papers had a bunch of stuff. First of all, it's from the archive of the Great Falls Tribune, but it's not public. So whoever got this had access to the Great Falls Tribune archive, uh, uh, an employee. That's either John Olson or Linda. We think John Olson's in the clear. I do at least. The second piece of information is 2018, a criminal was apprehended, a con man forging documents. And we can see that he's forged four documents all for himself. They all have this double ring that was pointed out in the chat, meaning he's married. So this suggests that this person, which we've tracked down, Duke of Zill, as matching the face of Victor Garfield, the person Helena is supposed to be married. So we believe that he is making, he's a con man making himself fake IDs and a criminal, and he's previously married. So whoever found this information would want to tell Helena so she wouldn't marry him. So that's why we think it's Linda Lamb, who we know from here, from their private couple lesbian hookup uh, site, has been trying, has tells her on 214, 220, I've got something that you have to see. It's going to change. You're going to realize he's not who you think he is. And let's just look at this again. So Delilah Dandelion was Linda Lamb. It's a little, it's an, it's another um, alliteration name. Um, oh, but Delilah Dandelion is Helen. So Charlie, we think, is, is Linda. And um, let's see what she said. I just want to see the beginning. When am I going to see you again? I miss you so much. She says on January 3rd. I miss you too, but it will never work. There's no going back for me. Don't make them worse. We're talking about your life here. This is never going to make you happy marrying a man. And we know her parents are pressuring Helen. So it makes sense that Linda's trying to talk her out of this bad idea to get married. Okay, but nothing else important here. She's trying to break it up, and she does make a reference to fools. Not all that glitters is gold. Okay. In the hotel of Frank Rippon, this is what we're assuming set us off to track Frank Rippon are two things. One, way back on February 8th, he ordered a professional get glass cutter. And then he mapped out on the day how to get to the museum. Just evidence why we suspected wrapping. Michael Burke says, uh, whenever someone starts with, some of you might know me. Always guards my ears. Okay, I didn't, don't quite understand that, but... Um, any other terms on the dictionary sheet using Linda or Charlie's communications? I don't see anything. I really don't see anything that jumps out at me. Just some fun English expression. Okay, then we've got the map. We already looked at this before. We use this to track them down. Then the map of the all right, then the map of the whole area where we found the Museum of Fine Arts was here. They tried to get the show. They didn't. This did get it. Then we've got other places. What was that, the Central Library something? Is that where this was found? I'm trying to remember what we found at the Central Library. Found in the trash can at the Central Library. So this was actually found at the Central Library. There's something else that we, someone else we countered at the Central Library, I believe. Let's, let's, um, let's remember to look for stuff mentioning Central Library. Um, any other place here? We know the hotel where the Frank Rippon was. We know where the 
railway station was that Frank Rippon went to. There was a mention of a coffee shop at some point. I'm going to put this up here where we can still see it while we go on. Okay, so let's keep going through here. We've got this photograph on Linda's... We, sorry, it's not, her name's not Linda. It's Liana Lamb's camera. This we know was taken while, at the time when the crown was being stolen, but in the other museum. So we originally thought that was Leona's alibi, but it turns out that it's not Leona, it's uh, John uh, Olson was asked to take photographs by Leona with her camera. Very suspicious. The dating, Jonathan says the dating messages were from the library. Encrypted chat from a public computer at 23 uh, Western Gate, which is also the library. So that makes sense, right? Because we think it's Linda who's Charlie, and she's the one who uses, that's, she's using the library to chat, and she's using the library to print out her records. Makes sense. Okay, and she doesn't have an alibi, but John Olson does. Then we got this photo of Dylan Dunn's desk. He was a bit of a suspect, but we found out from his telephone call that his brother won the lottery, we believe, and from his tablet, it looks like his brother, before he won the lottery, was telling him to rob the place, and he says, I'm only going to rob it if, it if it's covered by insurance. And we know that he did get a letter on the 13th. A few days later, he inquires, and he finds out they're not insured. So that cancels off Dylan Dunn. This is from the museum that didn't get the show, that wanted to. It gave us a website. What did we learn from the website? What piece of evidence clue was useful? Oh, that's when we found the photograph so that we could know that this photograph, this website showed us that this photograph was at this, this museum, the wrong one, not the one where it's stolen. So that's what we got out of that. The bedding slip was a red herring regarding Edgar Dunn. We know that this fingerprint this belongs to Edgar, but we know he didn't win this bet. But it's not important because we believe he won the lottery. So that we consider a red herring. This information told us that room six is occupied by Frank Rippon. And then he, we later found, he later admitted that he was planning to rob the museum, but this is just how we found what room he was in. Some general fingerprints, the only one we ever found any use for was Edgar Dunn. The rest of these we never encountered. And in fact, we never encountered any other fingerprints that we would want to check on, right? I believe that's the case. I suppose we don't want to be too quick to rule out the possibility that there's someone else in here that we should care about. Is, is Liana here? Don't think so. There's no reason to think that it's not just all about Zach. No, I don't think there's anyone else in here. Uh, let me know if you if you can think of anything else that we could have gotten fingerprints on. We'll check website in a second. All right, next up is our 
a conversation that Lynn, Leona had with John Olson. Now, we didn't pay this much mind, but let's look at it again. This is John Olson's web history. And let's look if we can get any more clues of Leona. So on the third, he writes to Leona, do you want to get together later, talk over research on the supermarket thing after the copy deadline? I was just at your table, but couldn't find you. Okay. Oh, look at this. The Tribune is at the library. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, sorry. Um, the Tribune is at 25 Wellesley Gate. Let's just make sure that we didn't think one of these was at the library. This one says it was at the library. Where's the Cupid one? 23 West Stoner Gate. West, okay, so th these were both printed at the library, but the Tribune is at 25 Wellesley Gate. Let's just see where that is. 23 Westover is... Twenty three Westover Gate. Where's Wesley Gate? Westover Gate. Okay, so twenty three Westover Gate. Hard to see exactly where it is, but maybe somewhere in here is the central library. Maybe this red building here. Oh no, they're color coded, so we want blue. West over. Here it is. Okay. So here is the library where we found the uh, couple dating app and the printouts. Now, what I want to see is where is the Tribune? The Tribune is at 23, 25 Wellesley Gate, which is right here. So pretty close. She's pretty close and she's a block away from the museum where the crown is. In fact, she's right next door to it. She might even have a back way in for all we know. So there's the Tribune and there's the museum where the crown is and there's the library. So it's a perfect location for her. And a perfect location next to the coffee shop. So let's see here. Research on the supermarket thing. She says, that works. I'm doing research again, so I'm out. My new home away from home, as it were. Let's meet at the coffee shop. It's sounding like she's spending her time in the library. Then she says, let's meet at the coffee shop for a quick latte. It's halfway between you and me. Earlier I saw that they opened back up. So I think her coffee shop is this one that's right here to Westover Gate, Mia's coffee shop. So like, I think she might live very near this library and near the Tribune. It just puts her in a perfect location for that. Okay, he's in Florida on the 14th. We know because he posted that article in the newspaper of the girl in the bathing suit. Um, okay, so she says on the 14th, I hate you. Just be glad you're not here. It's so boring. Really nothing going on. I'm glad it's the weekend now. Definitely time for something exciting to happen that's worth reporting about. The boss is already letting people go. Next Thursday... Next Thursday, I'm going to spend a couple of hours cleaning out the archives. Archives, that's what these were out, right? Do we have a date in which the pup, these were found? Because if we do, we could line it up. Uh, found in the archives, doesn't say when, though. She's, she's worried that there's nothing else to do. 
But this is the 14th. She's in a pretty good mood for someone if she's the one on the dating site complaining, but she sure sounds like it. And then he says, keep your chin up. I'm coming back on the 20th. We'll get started on the museum night event right away. We'll have plenty of time to talk. You can bring me up to date. Okay, anyway, that's her, Leona. All right. Let's see what else we got. So here's the Museum of Art and Culture where it got stolen. Here's Alice, who happens to know that the security system's terrible. So this points us towards Alice, but why would she be making public statements about the security system's terrible if she planned to abuse that information? All right. Here's after the robbery, him, the person saying, sorry, we the cameras were down. He's explaining it's a problem with them. And then that's where we took, we got to look at the photos that gave us the exact time of the robbery. Here's Alice's failed request to host the crown. Here's her application. No, here's the, re here's the request for people to submit application. Way back on January 3rd. Here's the original detailing to us the case. A golden nugget was left behind in place of the crown. It was pyrite, which is fake. I wonder if... Uh, like Linda is seen here on location in the near the water. Maybe that's where she found the pyrite. Duke of Zill says the symbol for the security look company looks like two circles. Yeah, a little bit, but not that much. All right, and then we've got this newspaper. Here's the picture of the pyrite. Um, Nothing really noticeable about that. It's a little... Uh, Linda has a... Uh, sorry, not Linda, but um, Leona. Let me change this here so I stop saying Linda. Leona has a double motive. One is to sort of hope the wedding gets called off, but the other is because she's afraid she's going to get fired if nothing interesting happens in this town soon. That's a newspaper. Okay, so in our paper we see... They're getting married. This tells us Cecil Schubert donates a lot of money to the city. It is weird to be donating money and then stealing stuff. This is Jonathan proving he's out of town. John Olson. Museum night event. He says, all the Great Falls Museum will be opening their doors to the public starting at 10 p.m. This would seem to give a good alibi to Alice, like she had to be in her museum for this night event. So I think that's going to be her alibi. Fine Arts will be taking part at the museum night under the management of Alice Fuller. So I think this is Alice's uh, alibi. And then we've just got stuff that shows he lost the bet. These don't seem relevant. And that's all of our evidence on paper. Then we found this, which we tracked down to be station bathroom. This gets to Jonathan's point about let's look at what the questions we're asked are. And then Mr. X describes himself as no glasses, no beard, gray and white hair, button-up blazer. And then if we look at our other notes that we wrote down. Uh, 
Frank Griffin says he went to steal it, but it was already gone. Dylan Dunn. Let me bring these people up. Um, let's go over this and then we'll take a little break and think. Dylan Dunn wrote and the insurance told him that it's not covered, so he wouldn't have done it. <coughs> Frank Rippon either delivered it to the station bathroom or not, but the fact that Mr. X wants to meet with us to can't take delivery suggests to me that he didn't. John Olson gave us a pretty good alibi of his time, and he took the photograph in the camera. That's a solid alibi. Leona Lamb has no alibi. And we believe she's the girl, she's the ex-flame. Victor Garfield, we know he's the con man. But he was hoping to marry in, so maybe he has no reason to try to steal anything. And we've got a couple of people that are clearly not real suspects. Elena is getting married. Edgar Dunn, we think, won the lottery, so he wouldn't do it. Cecil Schubert, we think, might very well be Mr. X. He matches the physical description, and he seems to have a good knowledge of the museums. So he is our best candidate for Mr. X, perhaps, with next up in line being... Alice, maybe. Okay. Alice, we think, is just the curator of this other museum. Angry, but not that ang angry, and she has to work that night. The jackpot number, which we've matched up, um, which we think is that. We think the security camera is just a coincidence. We know when it was stolen. There's a description of Mr. X, station, bathroom. Okay. So I think that is everything. Why don't we, um, well, let's, okay, let's take a look at our website stuff, then we'll take a break here. So there was the press release, the uh, conference, the interrogation of both people, Um then when we went to the scheduling, that's when we tracked him down. They found him, and they caught him. Um, this were the photographs that told us exactly when the crown was stolen. If we could, we, we were told the lock was broken. We don't see any glass cut. Maybe more evidence that it's not Frank Raffone that did it. The Museum of Fine Arts was just where we saw that that painting. Couple up was just where we saw his lesbian thing. And then the last thing is, let me just switch away in case. The last thing is we got uh, email from the camera people. And that's what gave us the photographs. And then on the webs, on the phone, we got the call from the guy. And here's the message we got from Mr. X. Let's just read this. You can't be serious contacting me right now. The handover will be here in one hour. And then station bathroom. Remember the notes you took and use them. I'm not wearing glasses. I don't have a beard and my hair is gray and white. I'm wearing a button up and a blazer. Okay. I think that's everything. Let's take a little break. We'll come back. We'll look at the chat. We'll talk a bit. And then we'll... Should we look at the questions first? Mr. X must be at the station bathroom in one hour. Yes. Um, where were the, did we get the questions on the first page? Here we go. Okay, let's, let's look at this. And then we need to take a break.
Where will the secret meeting be held? Okay, we decoded that station bathroom. Who is the secret client? What's up with the object in the display case? The pyrite. And who stole the midnight crown? Okay, so where's the secret meeting? We know that's going to be the station bathroom. Who is the secret client? That's going to be Mr. X. I think our best guess now is Cecil Schubert. But then what's up with the object in the display case and who stole it? This is the part where I think our guess is going to be that Leona stole it and she's leaving this pyrite in there as a message to Helena that her husband is, her fiance is fool's gold. But let's take an eight minute break. We'll come back, we'll talk it out, and then we'll proceed.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Co-op for Two. And we're at the end of the case. We're ready to solve it after we talk about it a little bit. So five hours or so we've been playing. That's pretty good. This has felt like a serious case. All right, let's um, switch to the chat and talk a little bit. <clears throat> Robert says, I think the fish in dictionary is a herring, as in red herring. That's, that's a definite possibility. It's interesting that we've only got one fingerprint unless we overlook something. There's the, there's what Robert is thinking might be a herring. I would not be surprised. No fingerprints on this document, is there? This would be the one. Well, even if there were, we couldn't trace it down to Leona because we don't have her fingerprints. All right. Um, we were talking in the chat a little bit about um, thinking about the conversation, the conversation that we heard, like the press conference, and um, Duke of Zill was saying, we're talking about if Schubert's Mr. X, Duke of Zill was saying, oh, that maybe, he asked a question at the press conference, and Duke of Zill was saying in the chat that it made sense, maybe he was scared, he wanted to know if the cops were on to him, but I was remembering his question about saying, I think he was saying, like, do you think it's still nearby? So in my mind, I think he's sitting in the audience being like, why hasn't my thief contacted me yet? And he's asking the cops, is the, is, do they think the crown is still in the neighborhood? Or has the person absconded with it? Um, the logo for the couple up looks like a crown. Lots of things look like a crown, huh? Where's couple up? Um... Yeah, the logo for Couple Up does look like a crown. I'm not sure what that logo is supposed to be of. So, so we've got Mr. X. Do we, if we believe Mr. X is different from Charlie, which I believe we agree is true because when we look at Charlie's chat, couple's chat, uh, she's still trying to convince her by the 14th. She's saying happy Valentine's Day. It's not until the 20th that she discovers she's really got some information to share with her about her fiancé being a scumbag. So I think it doesn't make sense for Charlie to be Mr. X. Um, in that case, it makes sense for Mr. X to be Cecil Schubert. And based on the fact that Cecil says, you'll recognize me, I have no beard, gray and white hair, and a button-up blazer, does make me think it's Cecil. It wouldn't be Victor, because Victor's still hoping to get married to her to marry into the money. Why would he steal the crown and risk messing up the marriage? Um, the only thing I was thinking at one point was, did Charlie go to Victor and be like, I know you're a con man, you better break it off. And so then at the last minute, Victor stole the crown. But then Victor wouldn't leave the pyrite. I mean, that's the little bit of a clue that whoever stole it is trying to send a message. And it makes sense that the one person trying to send a message is the ex-girlfriend, Charlie, who wants to tell her that her fiancé is fool's gold. And Leona has a double motive. Her other motive is because to keep her job, she's got to make something interesting happen in the... 
in town. And we think that Cecil used his influence to get the crown moved to the museum what that he knows has bad security. And he has the power to have that influence exerted because he's a big donor. So that would make sense. The only thing that's concerning us a little bit is how did Leona, if Leona stole it, how did Leona know that the security camera wouldn't catch her? Like, how did she know the security was bad? I guess she's right next door. She can sneak in the back. We know Alice knew that there was bad security, but maybe that means it was commonly known that it was bad security. Like, maybe that's how, what we should take out of it. That if we look at that social media page, Where is the social media page? The social media page says that Alice wrote on. She might be saying, hey, everyone knows the security is bad. Is that what it was? Alice in Wonderland says, what a terrible choice. Your security system has got to be the worst in New York. You're going to be screwed if something happens. So, I suppose if this is being written on the 3rd, then we can assume that our woman, Leona, might have read that and might have guessed. And she's a newspaper person. It would make sense that she would hear the scuttlebutt about that. All right, I want to hear what you guys think. Duke of Zill says, I'm of the opinion that Mr. X and the client is Schubert and that Leona is Charlie and the thief. Uh, that's where I am coming down on this. Cecil is the Mr. X. Leona is Charlie and the thief. So, Jonathan, Robert, how are you voting? So, our answers to these are, where is the secret meeting? We know we decrypted the message that says station bathroom. So, we don't, that we know. Whose secret client? We're guessing that's Mr. X. Cecil Schubert. What's up with the object in the display case? We're saying that Leona left it as a message about her, the fiancé, being fool's gold. And who stole the midnight crown? We're saying it's Leona. And we're saying, even though it's not asking us, her motive is both to stir up activity in town and to maybe get the wedding called off and buy herself time to convince we, uh, Helen to come back to her. Jonathan says, I think I'm with Zill and Jesse. So we're all on the same page here. We're all, I think, on the same page, and it's hard to see anything else. Alice, we think, is in her other museum where she has to work. John Olson, we bought his alibi. He took the photograph. Yep, I like it. Uh, Robert says the map has four photos on the right, and one of one of them is called Gallery Station. I believe that's Station Bathroom. Okay, let's take a look. Gallery Salon is what it's called. Gallery Salon. St. Henry's Church, Park Hotel, Bob's Diner. Let's see if anything says Station Bathroom. I mean, you have a good... It is a good point that that's a very ambiguous clue, station bathroom. How are we to interpret that? If it asks us for more detail. There's two ways to answer that. Um, 
One might be to guess that there's only one station in the center of Great Falls City, and that's the station that they found him here. When they say, uh, eyewitness indicate they saw the suspect at Naperville Station. So if we look at the the circles are stations. Where's our map? The circles are stations, but only one may be in the proper city center. And so maybe Naperville Station is the only station that anyone would assume you're talking about when you say meet me at the station. Although this sure looks like City Park would have a station. Sure looks like City Park would have a station. Trevor Crossing, Naperville. So I have to admit, it's a little ambiguous to say station bathroom. But we don't know if it's going to ask us for more detail. If the game asks us for, you know, what station bathroom, then we'll have to think about it. I think I'm with Jonathan. Jonathan says, I think this is a translation issue, to be honest, since bikes are also stations, according to the directions given. Yeah, I think it's just going to be station bathroom. But if it asks us to be more specific, we'll talk about it. All right, are we ready to try to answer the questions? Duke of Zill says ready. Jonathan, are you ready? Jonathan says he's ready. I've got my headphones here, actually, so I want to switch back so I can give you high-quality audio for the final audio. So let's um, let's switch to this. I want to play it and make sure it works so that we can both hear the proper audio. So I'm just going to play one of the press conferences and you tell me if you can hear it at high quality. Really embarrassing for a museum like this one. The thieves are probably long gone. Mr. Jason Mahoney from the New Haven Police Force, who is heading up the case, will now take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much that so many of you have joined us today. Can you hear it? As you all know, yesterday evening, the Midnight Crown was stolen from the Museum of Art and Culture in Great Falls during the Museum Night event. Based on our initial findings, it appears the perpetrators removed the crown from the rear exhibition hall, where it was located in a freestanding glass. So I heard it, but I heard it doubled. Now, why is that? Give me one second. Okay, I'm afraid that's not going to work. I can play it for you at high quality, but for whatever reason, I'm hearing it twice in my headsets. It's 
then took some pictures of the exhibits. Around 1 a.m., I left for the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. Did you meet anyone on your way to the Upstate New York? Not sure why that is. All right, we'll have to listen to it together through the speakers, and I can play it for you separately if we need to. Sorry about that. I'll try to work on that for next time. Uh, yeah, okay. Please make sure you look at All right, we'll have to do it that way. All right, here we go. Let's go to the... This has been, <laughs> it's been some, some rough edges on this live stream. Uh, you would think by now we would have gotten it all figured out. All right, so we're going to try to go to answer the questions now. All right, case, case two. All right. So the aim of the game is to prove successful police work together as a team. You have to go through the documents, draw clever conclusions, and think outside the box. Solve the case of the jewel heist during the long night of museums in Great Falls. Where will an important meeting take place? Who is the secret client? What is the mystery behind the item found in the display case? And who stole the midnight crown? Those are the questions we have here. And then it's ready to go. Okay, so, so when we're ready, oh, somebody's got some hints. It says, in certain parts of the game, you can ask for a clue. We decided against giving you tips throughout the games. This world made it too easy if you're stuck. Look down here, and then solution. Okay. If you can answer one or all of the questions, you can view the solution here to see if you've got it right. So that's interesting. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't ask us, oh. Okay, right. So of those four questions, most of those we just say show solution, then we have to guess. All right. So, um, the the only piece of our answer that gives me a tiny bit of pause is that pyrite fools gold now it seems like we understand it it seems like at the at the at the end of her lesbian chat she says In just two days, you're going to make the biggest mistake of your life, and I can't save you or stop you. Appearances can be deceiving. All that glitters is not gold. Mark my words. It's a little too on the nose. But it does seem like we don't have any other reason to think, and no one else would use that metaphor. It makes sense that she's trying to get Elena's attention. All right, you ready? Jonathan is just pointing out there could be an interesting translation idiom issue. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Where will an important meeting place place? We're saying station bathroom. Let's see what it says. It says, you received a call from, it's walking us through how we would get there. We get a call that Frank Rippon's in the run. You analyzed the data, you discovered that the destination was Northgate. Then you received access to the interrogations. Uh, we, you found the note and from the hotel with the code word for Mr. X, you sent him a text message. That was the most fun part that Jonathan figured out. Um, then he answered with the, the encryption code. Then we look it up. He says, I'm not wearing glasses. I don't have a beard and my hair is gray and white. I'm wearing a button up and a blazer. You found out that you needed to use the encryption code for the sequence of letters. That spells out station bathroom. That means the important meeting is going to take place at the train station bathroom. Okay, so we're right about that. And it didn't need any more information about what train station. It's a little weird that it doesn't, we don't care what train station. Okay, who is the secret client? All right, here we go. So we're guessing Cecil Schubert. Let's see. The secret client is Mr. X, who Frank Rippon was supposed to contact via text messenger. 
We, you will probably, you probably sent him the code SafeCracker and received his message. In it, he says he doesn't have glasses, doesn't have a beard, has gray hair. He's also wearing a button-up and blazer. Then you surely took a look at the poster. By process of elimination, you can em eliminate the person at the far left. That's Cecil. Oh, no, sorry. You could determine that the person at the far left is the only one it could be. It's saying just from looking at this, we should have known it's Cecil. This is an older gentleman who looks like well-to-do and is drinking a glass of whiskey in the photo. If you read the newspaper carefully, you notice that it's talking about Cecil Schubert. This rich resident of Great Falls has made many generous donations to the city in the past. He is also a whiskey aficionado and an art collector. This means that the secret client is Cecil Schubert, who hired Frank Rapone to steal the crown for him so that he could keep it in his private collection. Okay, this is exactly what we said, although we were hoping that it didn't rule out like, it, it shouldn't have been that he was the only one that matched that physical description. We we wanted to make some other leaps of logic there. Okay. Here we go. This is the part, this is the one I'm a little nervous about. What's the mystery behind the item in the display case? We're saying it's to warn off Helena that her fiancé is fool's gold. Of course, it was immediately clear that the gold was only pyrite. Still, leaving something behind after you steal an object is unusual. It doesn't seem to be an accident. In Great Falls today, they talked about the gold not being real, but rather fool's gold. Fool's gold is often used as a metaphor for someone or something that is fake, dishonest, or disingenuous. In the chat between Charlie and Delilah Dandelion, Charlie tells Delilah, all that glitters is not gold, mark my words. So it seems like this might have something to do with the pyrite. The pyrite is supposed to indicate some type of betrayal and that someone is being false and deceiving. At some point during the game, you have reviewed the letter from Jason Mahoney. It contained an article from the newspaper archives and you probably recognize someone in it, Victor Garfield. It looks like he has multiple identities and has even been married several times. He's committing marriage fraud. Someone must have found the report in the newspaper's archives and realized that Victor is nothing but fool's gold. And what's more, he's a gold digger. He only wants to marry Helena Havemeyer to get hold of her fortune for himself. Obviously, this person is Charlie, since Charlie warned Delilah that all that glitters is not gold. So that means Charlie could have stolen the Midnight Crown. But who is Charlie? Okay, so that's sort of giving you a hint that Charlie stole it. It's telling us something that we didn't need to be told. Okay, so now our final answer. Who is Charlie? And we believe, so here's the one that's asking us a question to make our final decision. All right, are you ready? It's either Leona or Alice, but surely it's Leona. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Leona Lamb urgently needs a new headline for her reporting, and she writes her colleague John Olson that she wishes something exciting would happen. That makes her seem more than a little suspicious. In addition, she often works at the Central Library and the chat conversation from the online dating site was found on a public computer. We can deduce that she is one of the people involved in the chat. The second person, Delilah Dandelion, quickly turns out to be Helena Havemeyer since they are talking about a date that, as we heard on the radio, is her wedding date. Both of the people in the chat must be women. As you have probably noticed, the site and how it's the wrong site here, perfect pair is not the right site, that might be a ge uh, German version, is a dating platform for lesbians. Leona is trying to stop Helena from getting married. She tells her urgently she needs to talk to her and that what she says will change her decision, but Helena doesn't answer. So Leona says she doesn't know what else to do. Finally, she tells Helena, appearances can be deceiving. All that glitters is not gold. It is possible that Leona stole the crown to prevent the wedding from happening, but she didn't have an alibi? But didn't she have an alibi? After all, at the time of the crime, she was taking a photo at the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. The photo taken on her camera was taken inside the Upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts at the time of the crime. You've probably already seen that on the museum website. Where they are advertising for the exhibition shown in the photos. But did Lena actually take the photo herself? During the interrogation with her colleague, John Olson, we learned that she gave her camera to her colleague and that she didn't actually take the photo herself. Remember that? That means Leona Lamb doesn't have an alibi. 
All we need to figure out is what kind of information Leona Lamb had that she wanted to give to Helena. Remember how she had to work in the newspaper art archives? That, that's what she wrote John in the email. The report on the forgeries came from the archive. She was the only one who found it and who discovered that Victor Garfield has multiple identities and is guilty of marriage fraud. She wanted to warn Helena, all that glitters is not gold. And the fool's gold that she left behind, what was she trying to tell Helena? Okay, when you solve the case completely and enter the name of the perpetrator, you can listen to the solution here. All right, here we go. Six minutes long. I'm sorry I can't give you the better quality audio. Jason Mahoney, hello. Glad I caught you. I received your documents with your findings for the case. I have to say, looks like you've done some great work once again. You definitely did not disappoint, and we have been able to catch Leona Lamb. But, right from the beginning, at first, we weren't sure when the Midnight Crown was stolen from the museum. According to eyewitnesses, it disappeared between 1 and 3 a.m. Thank God you requested the surveillance footage from Orwell and Truman and found out it must have been stolen between 126 and 133. First off, of course there are some suspicious individuals who would have had a motive. A vendetta by Alice Fuller? A way for Edgar Dunn to solve his money problems? Of course, Frank Rippon looked particularly suspicious since he was staying at the Montlake Hotel and did some suspicious research on the computer there. After the museum night event, Frank Rippon disappeared and went on the lam. With your help, we were able to pinpoint his location in Great Falls at Northgate Station and interrogate him. I sent you the file already. In the interrogation, he admitted that he was planning to steal the crown on behalf of an anonymous client, but that someone had beaten him to it and had already stolen the crown by the time he got to the museum. Then he just turned tail and ran off, from fear that he could become a suspect and the police might start investigating his other criminal activities. With your help, we also found out who he was working for, namely for Cecil Schubert, the Great Falls art patron. He's an art collector and wanted the crown for his private collection, so he hired Frank Ribbon to steal it for him. We lured Mr. Schubert to the agreed meeting point and arrested him there. Did you know that we found a whole load of stolen artworks in a hidden room behind a door in a bookcase at his estate at Great Falls? One of them was The Scream by Edward Munch. Although art patron Schubert encouraged Ribbon to do the deed, Ribbon was only planning to steal the crown. He was not the actual thief, but you did great work in your investigations and helped us catch Mr. Schubert and Mr. Ribbon at the same time. Two more criminals. But let's get back to the case at hand. Of course, right away you determined there were several people who could be eliminated as suspects. Dylan Dunn didn't really have a motive. Alice Fuller was talking to John Olson in the upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts at the time of the crime. And Edgar Dunn didn't have any more debts to pay off since he'd already won the lottery at the time of the theft. Leona Lamb also seemed to have an alibi at first, since her camera was being used to take photographs at the upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts at the time of the crime. However, you did some great detective work, and determined from the interrogation with John Olson that Leona Lamb gave him her camera during the museum night, asking him to take pictures for the upstate New York Museum of Fine Arts. That means she didn't have an alibi for the time at which the crime was committed. But what was her motive? You did some great work on this point, too. You figured out that Leona Lamb was one of the people chatting in the couple-up chat room on the library computer. And the documents I sent you later in the envelope cleared up everything else, I think. It's a chat room for lesbians. Delilah Dandelion and Charlie are both women. We also found out Leona Lamb's middle name. It's Charlotte. She was writing to her lover in the chat room, saying that she was about to make the biggest mistake of her life, and that she had made an important discovery. She was talking about the unpublished report from the newspaper archives that Miss Lamb had found while working there a few days earlier, as you learned from the email exchange between her and her colleague, John Olson. This report, which was never published, covered a criminal helping others to create fake identities and printing different fake IDs. Leona Lamb recognized none other than Victoria Garfield in the photos. The article made her incensed, so she contacted her lover, Delilah Dandelion, who, of course, later turned out to be Helena Havmeyer. Miss Lamb wanted to stop Miss Havmeyer from marrying a swindler who was only after her money. She had to warn her, 
but Helena, who certainly didn't want her family to know she was attracted to women, never responded, and wanted to end her affair with Leona Lamb. The wedding drew closer, and Leona Lamb didn't know what else to do. She had to find a way to warn Helena about her future husband and prevent the wedding. From the chat, we know that Helena blocked Leona's messages, and that she had also returned a letter from her unopened several days before. The editorial deadline at the newspaper Leona works for had also already passed for that week. That means Leona could have written an article about Victor Garfield in time in order to open Helena's eyes. She spontaneously made a plan to steal the midnight crown, which Helena would have worn during her wedding ceremony, in a bid to stop the marriage. Thanks to her journalist ID badge, she was able to enter the museum before the start of the museum night event and examine the room carefully. She discovered that the crown was not well secured and that the aging museum was not equipped to handle such valuable special exhibitions. While all of the visitors were listening to Sandra Swearen's reading, Miss Lamb used the opportunity to steal the crown and put a piece of pyrite in its place. The piece of pyrite, also known as fool's gold, was supposed to tell Helena that Victor Garfield was not what he appeared, a fraudster. She also told Delilah Dandelion, all that glitters is not gold, in their chat, to tell Helena that she was behind the message. Well, what can I say? <clears throat> Leona Lamb confessed. Stealing the crown was just a means to an end for her, and she sent it back to the museum director's house just a few days later, anonymously. His neighbor accepted the package and forgot to tell him. That means the famous midnight crown has been in the UPS box since February 26, 2020, in a storage room belonging to the neighbor of Dylan Dunn. As you know, Helena Havmeyer and Victor Garfield's wedding was canceled. Of course, it wasn't because of the stolen crown, like everyone assumed. It was because Helena Havmeyer understood Leona Lamb's clue. The wedding has not been rescheduled. Helena has broken up with her fiancé and thanked Leona Lamb personally. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what happened to the two of them. It's their private affair, after all. Leona Lamb's punishment is still being decided. I think that the court won't be all too harsh on her, but she did still commit a crime. To conclude, I want to thank all of you once again for your outstanding work. I have to say, without you, we definitely wouldn't have gotten this far. If we need your help with another case over the next few months, I hope it's okay for us to call on you once again. Well, there you have it. There you have it. We solved it. We got it all correct. It filled in a couple more details. It told us somehow we uh, should have seen Leona Lamb's middle name was Charlotte. I didn't find where we would have seen that. It didn't seem to be in the email or in the newspaper. And it filled in a little bit of detail. It said that uh, she probably used her press pass to check out the, the crown ahead of time and noticed that there was no security system. That's fine she would have we 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 came up with our own explanation for why she thought it was safe um okay why don't we take a very short five minute break and we'll come back you'll get you'll get your thoughts together how you like the game i'll get my thoughts together and then we'll talk a little bit about it and then chat about whatever you want to chat about so i'll see you in five minutes
We're back. You're watching Caught for Two. We've solved the case of the Midnight Crown, and now we're going to talk about our impressions of it. Um, and then we'll just hang around and chat about whatever you want to chat about. I will give my, before we start, my little plug, a little taste testing. I was thinking we should, in these long videos, have like an intermission where we do some sort of taste testing, like in my old ones. I was taste testing some chocolate by Joe. This guava, uh, La Croix flavored sparkling water is my favorite of all the La Croix. La Croix, I believe they're pronounced. Guava, that's what I recommend. Okay, let's start with Jonathan's comments here. Jonathan says, Robert says this was very fun and detailed. Jonathan says, I think it's fair to rank it with adventure. I would still probably put it below Still Lake in Antarctica, probably somewhere with Kaifeng and Adverstein. A pro is a very nice use of online resources. Pro seems like a nice difficulty to the case. Duke of Zill, you give us your thoughts too, Robert as well. I mean, I think, <clears throat> let me give some of my comments and then I'll come back to these here. I think Jonathan uh, said it well, and that may be the best, this is a, a, a high high praise to say this is right up there with the adventure series in terms of qual overall quality of experience. And um, Jonathan says he would rank this a little bit below the top of the adventure cases. I think maybe so. Maybe the adventure cases had some more moments of real, real chewing on trying to figure things out. Whereas this one, we were sort of proceeding at a fairly reasonable clip, figuring things out. We never got truly, truly lost, and we never truly were hitting our heads against the wall. So I think in terms of difficulty, it's on the easier side of the adventure cases. Um, maybe easier than all of the adventure cases. But in terms of overall experience and the experience of all of that fancy online stuff, there were online websites to go to, the phone calls. I, I have a little bit of concern about the phone call thing where you start out by them making a phone call to you and then he calls back in 50 minutes and the text message stuff. I think it worked. It was nice. I have a little bit of concern that at some point it's going to break. And the idea that you would have to do that for every different country and that most of the stuff, the online stuff, like the phone call, it was nice. The game said, look, if you don't have a phone, you click here and you hear his first call and then you hear his second call. Um, that's fine. But I think one of our favorite moments in the game, correct me if I'm wrong, was when we made a phone call to that number, which was Mr. X, and it said, it was a New Jersey call, and it said this phone's disconnected. And we were like, okay, that makes sense. There's got to be some other way. And Jonathan said, just text that code word to the text message because he talks about he only uses text messages to call, talk, and he gave us that code word to use. And sure enough, we texted that um that code word to that text message service and then got back a text and that was maybe the highlight of the game my favorite part where we got that message that let us decrypt it but that seems very fragile like as soon as the text messaging connections that they've set up for this game in in the different countries as soon as that breaks that's a big part of the game that's going to break and it's going to break in a way that the players may not realize has broken and they'll have to go on and get a hint. So uh, it was very cool. It made sense in terms of the game, but I have a little bit of concern about that. Getting back to though, I do think 
I want to spend a little bit more time talking about recommending it because while Jonathan and I, I think we both disagree that it may rank a little bit below the adventure games in terms of overall experience of trying to solve it. This might not be the a bad first game of this genre to play as a family. There are some parts about it that make it very that make it highly recommendable for that. All that online stuff and the phone call make it very cool and would be a very fun thing if you were getting together with your family or a group of people and have those phone calls come in. And the multimedia stuff, the audio video, well, no video, but the audio voice acting, both at the end of the case and the press conferences were very cool. This map is a brilliant idea. And I don't know if you need a poster to put up on the wall, though that would be cool. If you were playing at home, you'd probably hang this up. You could also just provide cards for each of the suspects. Um, that's very helpful. I've said before, I think all games should have cards for each person you meet. But what was unexpected here, which was interesting, is that this list of suspects, this map, had some clues in it and missing data. And that was quite fun. Most of the people didn't have their names listed. Some did. They had physical photos, which were useful in solving clues. One, you couldn't see their face, but you got some information about them. So, like, the the fact that this was its own little clue with little subtle details was very nice. And this is a fun prop to use. And the fact that we also got a map of the area that let us do some spatial reasoning. Very nice. So, like, the totality of the props and the feelies and that stuff made this very fun. And the fact that it was a little easier than the adventure games might make this even more of a good first one to go into. It wasn't a gruesome murder. So as long as your your family could absolutely play this and you could play with kids and completely enjoy it. And it wasn't super easy either. There were some real moments and there were some ups and downs where like, it's this person, then they're like, oh, they have an alibi, it's this person. Like there was some fun figuring things out. There was some encryption. There was a puzzle. I think that puzzle might give people some trouble, but there's a very full hint system. If you got stuck, you could go for hints. So I think I would highly recommend this as uh, an early game to try to see if you really like this kind of game and the cool evidence. Uh, I had a nice act one, act two thing. So overall, really good, and overall would highly recommend it and recommend it as one of the first games you play, probably over the Adventure series as a first game to play. Let's catch up on the chat a little bit. Um, John says, seems like a very nice difficulty to the case. Lacan, Jonathan says, could have helped us get a little more emotionally invested earlier. Yeah, pro, not just another murder mystery. Yeah, I'm not sure how... Yeah, it was a sort of a very low... What's the right term? It was a, it was a low consequence case. It wasn't like... It was a little theft of some, of some jewelry in a sort of rich people's world. It didn't seem like there was that much riding on us solving it. But it was fun to uh, see the personal details of some people. And we've talked about like the best of these games after you figure it out, when you look back, certain things make sense. And it was fun when we went back and listened to the earliest audio, the press conferences. We heard some of our characters ask questions, right? That now made a little more sense uh, and sort of clicked into place once we knew the solution. And that was fun. It was fun to hear their questions once we thought we figured it out. Duke of Zill says, uh, it did feel similar to Death in Antarctica for me, which is a good thing. I'm not sure if we were too clever, but there weren't many tough head scratching moments. I did miss those. Yeah, I think that's an accurate statement. This did not have the real kinds of head scratching moments 
that the best of the adventure cases had. But um, all the more reason why you might start with this and proceed to the adventure as your final stop on the when you really want a hard case. John says, here's a nitpick. Maybe too many characters. Maybe a few got eliminated too early. Maybe. Maybe. There were some that were sort of throwaway eliminations. Like, it was a little weird that, like, the, how the brother got eliminated because of winning the lottery. That was a little far-fetched. And the other brother got eliminated because he checked with the insurance company. So they did had to rule out some people quickly. But um, the characters that were front and center for us did give us some pause. Like, we really had to spend some time. And the fact that there were two people, there was the ro three people, the robber, Mr. X, and then Charlie, and then trying to figure out who stole it. That was a nice, that was a nice conundrum for us, trying to figure out, are they the same people? Did he really steal it? Like, that was fun. Um, Duke of Zill says, I like that it was logical, solvable, and provable. Though I prefer it to be a bit tougher, but still quite good. I would agree with that. Robert says, it was a very multimedia game. My only concern about it, if the company ever went out of business, the game would not be solvable. Yeah, I do think that's a concern. I normally don't worry so much about that, but with, so with all of the little intricacies of getting phone calls, especially the text message, and then the online part where you had to solve it. Um, although the company definitely looks like they've made real efforts. They made efforts to make uh, PDFs of all the audio so that if you can't, if you're hard of hearing, you have stuff to read. So they've worked hard to make it accessible to everyone and make ways around it if you don't have a phone with the hints. But some of it would suffer. And I think, well, let me read the rest of these and I'll say a little bit more. Uh, Michael Bork says, it is a concern with online services, but in software development, uh, Y-A-G-N-Y, I don't know that acronym. Oh, you ain't going to need it. By the time service dies, there might be an app for this game to mimic, etc. cetera. Um, I do think like y you could get 99% of this game if it just if you just had a printout of hints that you could read except for that one text message is going to hurt a bit. Um, some parts felt like we went over a boost to thrust us along. Frank Ribbon and his escape and the envelope evidence dumped with the fake IDs. Um, there were some uh, cool moments in this game, and the best of these games have these multiple acts, and this one did it. That envelope that you only open uh, at a certain point, and then when we got those IDs, that was super cool. Things clicked into place and made sense really nicely. Um, there were a bunch of little translation hiccups. They weren't showstoppers, but you could see they have to translate into all these different languages. There were a couple hiccups where things mostly just weren't clear. Like we had to we had to make our leaps of understanding. And it happened quite several times. There was the part when they arrested Frank Ribbon and John Olson, and we were like had to reason our own way out of why they brought in John Olson at the same time. And the tracking down the Frank Ribbon who's escaping was more of a logic puzzle, but it wasn't really clear what it was asking for. It seemed like that was a lot there was a lot of complicated stuff on that website where we were choosing where you'd escape to, that just seemed a little far-fetched. Like, why didn't it just ask us a multiple-choice question of where he went? That was a little weird. And there were a bunch of places like that that just felt a little... The translation was a tiny bit off, but not enough to be showstopper. Um, Duke of Zil says he absolutely would recommend it as an early, easy, medium difficulty case. Quite family-friendly. Yeah, not, not, not super easy. Um, I've played a lot of these mystery suspect games by like the murder party, murder mystery party, um, the American versions, and they are much shorter, much easier, much straightforward. This is 
substantially more difficult and involved and serious a case than those. So this is very close to adventure, just a notch easier. Jonathan Warner says, here's a con, the map puzzle. Not the puzzle itself, but I don't think it would be good for a group. I think it kills the pacing of the game a bit. Give a bigger map so uh, if a person could contribute. Um, that is, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I have a mixed feelings about that. I do agree with you, and I've talked about this before. There are certain games that are more that have rely more on the logical puzzles, like the escape uh, exit games and the escape tales. There are a bunch of these that have sort of math constraint puzzles, and those can be very enjoyable. Like I enjoy doing that thing, but it absolutely sort of means one person is going to be doing that, or one or two people can be thinking about how do you solve it, and then one person has to do it. And I. It was fun for me, but you can absolutely see how that would grind the group down to a halt. You could have, there might be one person in your group that likes that kind of thing, and they might just go off and try to solve it in their own corner. But I do think, uh, in general, it is a little bit jarring. I do think you're right there. When we when you say map puzzle, what you, you're talking about is the, the where, how did he escape puzzle. The public transportation puzzle. And I thought it was cool and it was fun, but I agree with your what you're saying. It could be a problem. Um, makes a point of saying the map puzzle is urgent, but a long puzzle one person probably going to focus on. Uh, you, you do bring up another point about the urgency that I think was a slight miss of the game. So the game starts off with a phone call and then it's set to be timed so that 15 minutes later he calls and he tells you Frank Ribbon is on the escape. Go, here's how to log in. I think that's a bit of, that was a bit of a miss. First of all, it gave us information before we were ready for it. The entire Frank Ribbon thing was a bit of a miss. This gets back to the translation thing. That felt very weird. Like here was this person that... All of a sudden, they were hunting, and we had no reason they should be hunting for him. We did get to the document eventually, which showed us why he was in that room, but we had to make up our own story for why they were paying attention to that room. And based on the idea that someone made, maybe observed what he had been on the web browsing for. But that's a weakness of these document dump games where we got this whole dump of documents that were out of order, not in order. And that would have made much more sense in one of our crime dossiers from the 30s. In that, we would have eventually gotten to a page where someone would have sent in a tip about a hotel room and a person and something they discovered. Then we would have gone to that. Then they would have said, okay, we got to hunt this Frank Rippon down. And it would have progressed in an orderly manner and a sequence that made sense here it didn't make sense and then the phone call saying trace down this guy was just out of the blue so the fact that they couldn't sequence it didn't make all that much sense and maybe they could have done that with a website where we could have discovered it discovered this person so something went off there a little bit it didn't enter it didn't interfere too much with the enjoyment but it felt off and we thought maybe did we miss something and then more discussion here between Jonathan Warner and Duke of Zill about we needed more setup for Ribbon. Yeah, that that was, something was missing there. Um, Jonathan Warner says, to clarify with the travel puzzle, I do think maybe it could work with the pers in-person group if you had a gumshoe site, if you had a giant map where different people could each trace a different potential route each. Yes, maybe. Maybe. It was a very cool prop. It was a very cool puzzle. But it's just a matter of how playable is it in a group and whether that bothers you. Um, I did... I think uh, the encryption stuff needs a little bit of a uh, pat on the back. Um, 
So it's very common in these games, it seems, to have a little bit of encryption going on. The Hunt a Killer games in particular seem to throw in a little bit of encryption in every, of, every game they made, all the standalones and probably in the subscription boxes. And some of them are just silly and trivial. The moment you look at it, you know what it is. And then some of them are a lot of... One of the Hunt a Killer games had such an annoying, painful, brute force method that you had to go through to solve it. It was obvious what you had to do, but the actual practice of decrypting this message was laborious and not fun and time consuming. So I appreciate this one and I appreciate the sort of staging of stuff. And I think in general, the, this game did a very good job of having us get a clue and then have to chew on it for a while before it made sense. And that was fun. And the encryption had that flavor. We got it. We chewed on it. We were like, can we do work on it now? Do we have enough? Do we not? And by the time we, we never got really, really stuck. Um, and then when it came time to decrypt it, it was fairly straightforward. It was clean. It was, it wasn't, wasn't overly convoluted, but it was somewhat satisfying. Um, Jonathan says, interesting, included some LGBT representation. Yes, that was good. I would have liked to go around on that site a little more. That was a little weird that we couldn't click on it, that that was all it was trying to tell us. But yeah, I mean, I think we talk about emotional connection. That was the, that was the emotional connection in this game that hooked us, I think, a bit. This idea that we read this conversation where Charlie was trying to talk some sense into her and she didn't want to listen. And that was... That was a nice, enjoyable part. Duke Zill says, I did like that it did require some effort to eliminate each suspect. Even the silly lottery winnings needed to be discovered with the numbers matching his birthday. Yeah, I think you could say that a, a lot of these clues, one of the more satisfying aspects of these games is when it's not just like you read a clue and then you know how to apply it. You read the next clue and you apply it to eliminate someone else. This had more of those multiple chained things that we loved in the adventure series. Maybe not as many chains as there, but here this was like photograph. Oh, that clears this person. Whoops, no, it doesn't. We got some clarification or timeline. We got a wide range and now we're able to narrow it down. And the ability to like, okay, we know this person has this criteria, but we don't even know which person, who they are. So we did a little bit of constraint satisfaction trying to put names to faces, but maybe we were wrong. That kind of stuff was really uh, fun. Um, John says, I think the pacing might have been slightly off in terms of the first and second acts, but works for the most part. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. It We... That partly relates to the fact that we never really stopped moving forward. And it might have been nice to get stuck and hit our head against the wall. Although, you know, you can blame yourself for that. Partly, Jonathan, for figuring out that we should send that text message. And everyone in the chat, this was a group effort in this chat. Everyone came in a bit and had some breakthrough that kept it moving very quickly. But... I'm curious to play the first case now, and we should talk about when we want to play that next week or this weekend or whatever. I'm ready to play it when you guys are. I would like to play both of them and then make a spoiler-free review of both of them. Um, you can think about what your favorite parts were and what your least favorite part. My favorite part, I think, was was the text messaging that gave back the encryption key um, as far as favorite specific moment. And then I think favorite sort of flavor feature of this game was trying to convince ourselves that we had the right division between Mr. X, Charlie, and then who stole it. The fact that we had those three pieces that we had to get all in their right boxes and feel comfortable about. Like for any given one, it made sense. And once we really ruled out people, it made sense and we were convinced we were right. But that was fun doing that. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about a side thing um, now while you guys are giving your other stuff. Oh, Duke of Zill says, hearing so many of our characters come alive in the audio clips was a nice level of immersion. I think that's a good point. Um, that we actually heard audio of the different people in our case. We heard from half the people, we actually heard their voice, and that was fun. And I apologize for, for uh, being out of practice with the laptop audio. I'll get that solved next time so that you can hear it in high quality. I'm glad we got it working well enough. Um, okay. Uh, Michael was asking earlier, do you still have a Patreon or some way to support? Um, there's no more Patreon. When the channel started, I thought, I mean, I love the idea of Patreon and I love Patreon. Um, so the, the main answer to your question is there's no Patreon. There's no way to support this channel. You don't need to, don't worry about it. We're doing, I'm doing it for fun now, but I will say this, like, Go give Patreon to those people who are creating content who do have a Patreon. It would have made a difference. I mean, the channel was started a year and a half ago and the Patreon was right up from the start. And I made a little, edited a little channel trailer where I made a pitch for if you like what we're doing, please support us. And at the end of the videos, it was please support us on Patreon. And I was told at the beginning from people who are doing this, and there are some channels that are making lots of money doing, that are very popular channels with tons of, you know, 30,000 subscriptions. And I was basically told, you can't start a Patreon now. First, you put your channel out for a year, you get everyone into it, and then you do a fundraiser and ask for Patreon. I just thought, I don't want to do deal with any of that convoluted stuff and having to say, surprise, we need money to keep going. I thought we'll just be as straightforward as possible, ask for support. And we got two people, two or three people, in addition to my friends and family, who were really nice enough to support us right from the start. Um, and I think, you know, I started this channel with Greg, and it was done as an experiment without a real reason behind doing it. If if things had, there was no expectation that things were going to turn out differently or that, that we would get any support or anything. But if there had been a lot of support on Patreon and it had started bringing in hundreds of dollars a month worth of support, and you could imagine if you're a popular board game channel, if everyone gave a dollar a month and you've got 30,000 subscribers, you could uh, make that your day job. So I think you know, if things had turned out differently, if for some reason our earlier videos had gotten some attention and gotten lots of Patreon supporters, then we would have maybe run with it and started filming, you know, three videos a week. And it might have been something that Greg could do as a part time job, etc. And the channel would have gone in a different direction. You'd have more videos. You'd have Greg. Maybe, maybe. But it wasn't to be. That's okay. We're on a different path now, and I'm playing for fun, and you don't need to support. Uh, there's no need or way to support. If you're, for some reason, want a little espresso mug, there's an espresso mug you can buy. I don't get any money from it. It's selling at cost, wherever it is. I forget Zazzle. But if for fun you want to get an espresso mug to drink along when, when you watch, that's fine. But my suggestion is, if you're interest, if you have some thought to support this channel, instead, send your Patreon to a channel that is using that could use the support. And to everyone who might be watching, which is only three or four of you, give some real thought about the next time you see someone asking for Patreon, of sending them some money, especially if you really like it, because it it could make the difference for someone. It's not going to make the difference for me for these videos but it could make the difference for someone. I enjoy being able to play these and share this experience with you guys. I did not realize when I started doing these that it would make a difference to me to be able to play them with someone else on the channel. That's the joy I'm getting. So that's, the, that's enough thanks for me that you play these and share your thoughts and that we can play them together. It really does make it more enjoyable for me and comments. Jonathan tends to leave comments after we play the video on the YouTube with some 
more considered thoughts. Love it. Um, okay. Robert says, I think if at the beginning of the game, the letter from Mahoney said something like, after you've read all the material and solved one of the goals, would then be to give Mahoney a call, the pacing would work better. Um, I think I would agree with that. That It would make a little more sense, at least. You'd have to figure out how to do it. But I think it would make a little more sense and be easier to implement if basically the game was structured in two or three acts where the way you triggered the sequence from the first act to the second act was you go on the website and you say, hey, I figured something out, now give me act two. I guess solving that travel puzzle did that. The only problem was that the game called us with saying they were hunting this guy down and that didn't feel right. It would make more sense if the detective was like, I'm lost, what should I do? And if we on our own figured out, hey, go hunt down this person, here's where to find them. And then the detective was like, hey, I did what you said and here's what I found. Whereas instead the game was like, this guy's on the run, tell me where he is. And then once we found him, he also sent us an envelope totally unrelated to that guy, right? It was like, I found him. Here's the interview with him. Oh, and also here's some stuff I found in some trash cans. That was a little odd. It would make more sense if we did something um, that, that directed them to get us information. So I agree with that. Um, Michael Bork is making a nice comment, but I think it's fine as long as you don't demand or promote it every 30 seconds. Yeah, no, uh, we don't, I don't need any money. I don't need any Patreon. We're just going to do this for fun and as long as it is fun. Uh, but you can give to, uh, give to an, find another, another channel that would appreciate it. Duke of Zill says, I think it would be nice if during the answer reveal, it was a step-by-step -step reveal similar to adventure. Then you could make adjustments. This is a good point. I do think that the solution steps here were not that satisfying. It was nice that that last one was a question because the other, um, everything but the last question was just click here when you want to read the answer. <clears throat> that felt a little bit like a miss. And not only that, so it had four questions, which it showed us on our sheet, which was nice. But then the way they are done is just says, show us the solution rather than asking us questions. And I do think that's a bit of a miss. And then we were, so only the last question is given as a question, which is good. That was good. But it was weird that the third question actually told us, hey, that means Charlie could have stolen the Midnight Crown, but who is Charlie? So the third one is basically telling us, hey, it's Charlie who stole it. That, that that's, wasn't necessary. Now let's see what would happen if we had said Alice did it. So there's a, if you answer wrong, it gives us a little explanation. Alice Fuller doesn't exactly have a positive opinion of the Museum of Art and Culture. On Facebook, she left comments such as Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but was she actually at the Museum of Art and Culture at the time of the crime? Listen to the interrogation with John Olson one more time and take a look at the Great Falls map. The two museums are some distance apart. So that's not a bad way, but it might be nice if all of the questions were had that flavor of asking you to actually pick an answer and then gave you feedback when you were wrong a little bit. I think that might have worked better. That was a little weird how these were show solutions and gave away information. Um, so yeah, we could pick either of these. I guess Edgar is going to tell us he won the lottery. Frank, if we say it, says Frank looks suspicious. You figured he out he stopped in Northgate. Several facts came to light. He was actually planning to steal it, but it already disappeared. By the time he got to the museum, it had already disappeared. <clears throat> This is a little bit of a miss here. Um, it's basically saying he couldn't have stole it because he had disappeared because it was gone by the time he got there. But that's what he says. We figured out it was it was we believed him because 
Mr. X hadn't gotten it and he wasn't found with the crown on it. So a little bit. And Robert says, can you take a look at the hint system? Yes, I think that's a great idea. Let's take a look at the hint system. Um, here's another small miss. When you're ready to solve it, you have to scroll through the hints. That's a little uncomfortable, but okay, let's take a look at these hints. I like this. A nice rich hint system, I think is a great idea. Um, for when you get stuck, you want, you want to be gently helped. So let's see, what should we look at? Let's look at the police schedule planning tool. Okay. You can view the schedule playing tool on the police server if you have not yet logged in. First, look at the clue letter from Mahoney. All right, well, it doesn't it doesn't really help it help you solve it that much. Um, let's look at Supernet. What's this about? An interesting post from the Museum of Art and Color Culture, don't you think? Well, that's not very useful. How about email exchange? An email exchange between colleagues John Olson and Leona Lamb. John is contacting Leona after his vacation. Could the email exchange indicate a potential motive? Okay. Uh, evidence photo. Piece of gold found in the glass case where the midnight crown is being displayed is not real. The police have identified as pyrite. Okay. How about hotel occupancy? Who is staying in room six when the crime was committed? Can you find the associated documents? Well, they're not exactly super rich um, clues, but... Uh, public transport schedule. It's not really a schedule, is it? It's a map. Another little transportation. A schedule of public transportation from Great Falls. A call you received gives you a hint about what this means. If you have not yet been playing for 50 minutes, wait a little longer. If you have been playing for 50 minutes and not received the call, look at the clue call from Mahoney. If you don't know what to do next, click additional clues, okay? Call give you a password for the schedule planning tools. Your job is to track Frank Rippon's escape route. Inspector Mahoney is at the Naperville station. Can you guide the inspector to his destination using the suspect's credit card data? Make sure he takes the suspect into custody. Make sure to listen to what the inspector is saying while you track him. I'm a little curious to see what it says if we do the wrong thing there. Or is it too late? Too late. It already gives us our answer. Oh, here we go. This is our tool. Okay, so what if we say go to Beachside? Okay, so it's actually a richer little... They actually wrote a complicated little thing here. So you don't have to pick the, the final place. You could do it piecemeal. You could say... He did go here, then did he go to Highway 12? So you click there and you wait, and it tells you whether they saw him there. So if you pick a wrong direction, it's going to say he's not there. I believe that this is a delay on purpose to keep you from just clicking. So if you go here, somebody told me he probably passed, but he's not here. So I'm going to click where we know he didn't go through, and it's going to say that he wasn't seen here. No trace. Okay, so if you couldn't figure it out deductively, you could slowly click on places until you track down his path and you found out where he went by finding places he's gone to. So a little bit interactive. You just follow the things. You say, okay, the first thing he did was he took a train. So you'd click the three train locations until you found out where he went. So you could have solved it without the difficulty just by sitting there, and maybe that wouldn't have been too uncomfortable. It was fun to be able to solve it logically, though. Jonathan Warner gives me some credit for getting it right. This was definitely a team effort. Story-based hints might be better. 
Um, Duke of Zill says, it's interesting that the hence system is categorized by piece of evidence. If you were stuck, how would you know which piece of evidence to click on? That's an interesting point. I guess you would just click on the ones that you didn't think you understood. It did feel like most clues had one and only one use, right? Like almost everything we found had one and only one use. The fingerprints had one and only one use. The chat, the ID cards had one and only one use. So I guess if you got one that didn't, that you didn't know how to use, you would might go. Hint system, answer system could use a little bit of work. It's 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 serviceable, serviceable, but a little weird. I do like that they had this audio solution. Again, if it, if you were a group playing, it might be even more enjoyable. Any other thoughts? There was some subtlety, like we figured out he was a whiskey drinker, that stuff. I didn't love when it said, the solution said, you no doubt, when you, were, when you heard that Mr. X said he had no glasses, no beard, and gray hair, and a bottom-up blazer, it said, once you read that, you know who Mr. X is. Well, I'm glad we didn't assume it was that simple. Um because that would be a little disappointing. I liked that we had to figure out that was Mr. X by ruling out people and using a little bit of intuition. All right. But overall, very fun. How would you compare this to the crime dossier games? So not nearly as emotionally involved sort of novel story as the crime dossiers, much more focused on documents, but much more of a real mystery to solve. Duke of Zill says, Mr. X wears the same clothes every day like Batman. I like the use of fingerprints. I wish there was more. I agree with you. It would have been more enjoyable to have multiple fingerprints that we could make use of. Yes. It was fun to find one fingerprint that we could use, though. I do think that one of the things I got out of all those crime dossiers we played, which didn't even occur to me, all of these mystery suspect games all have the same exact feature. Every single one I've played, the dozen or so I've played, all share one feature, which is the documents are dumped in you in random order. There is no order to those documents you get, and some of them are at different dates, but it's up to you to sort of put them back in order and make sense of them. I understand that. It does present a bit of a puzzle, but I, after playing those crime dossiers, I am completely sold on the crime dossier approach to sequencing the document evidence, sequencing it as if someone is a detective is giving it to you or you're sequencing it in the order you get it. I think that makes for a more compelling story. And the way you would rephrase it would be that the detective calls you in on the first page and he gives you some evidence. And then maybe you turn the page and you hear about Frank Rippon and so it could stage stuff more closely. I don't think we need to have the documents in random order. I don't think that adds much of a mystery to it. Robert says, I think uh, it would have had a more emotional if we got the feelings of the wedding couple's parents on the wedding being canceled. I think this gets Robert and uh, Jonathan was making a similar point about the emotional connection. It might have been nice to take the opportunity, especially if you're going to do some voice acting to give us a little more of the personality of these people and maybe bring us a little bit into Helen's world. Yeah, a little more emotionally involved. I, I agree with that. Duke of Zill says, I love how deep the story can be in the crime dossier cases. Uh, and yes, about he uh, he's agreeing about the, the linear control of the story is, is better. I think, yeah, the trade-off 
favors the linear control of the story. And you can then gatekeep in that linear story. You can you could say, like after five pages, you could say, stop, wait till you figure something out, go to the website. Like you could structure that that dossier of documents into five chapters and only unlock each one after the person figures something out if you wanted to. Um, Jonathan Warner says, I think that trying to figure out the dates on the calendar works better for spy fiction theme game like Vienna Connection. That's a good point. This, this thing, when we saw this, looked very promising. Like we were going to have to really figure out dates and times that would alibi people and make sense of there were lots of dates on lots of stuff that were pretty cool like there was february 8th when their wedding was announced like this had the possibility for being a cool thing for us to figure out timeline wise but in reality it really didn't it really didn't come into play the only interesting note I've made here is that the lottery drawing was done before it was stolen. But other than that, we didn't need to know anything about the dates. And the timeline, we only we got one clue that told us exactly when it happened, and that was basically it. So that was a bit of a missed opportunity. So when shall we play case one? Jonathan, Robert... Duke of Zill, when are you available to play the first case? Who is it Robert that's already played case one? Is it Robert or Duke that's already played case one and the New Haven case? Duke of Zill says, in the dossier cases, I love slowly gathering people's timelines and alibis, repeated interviews, learning new information. Duke of Zill says, the map of New York City and Rufus Ray, we used to track people's movements, was so much fun. Uh, this didn't have as good a sense of place. Yeah, I mean, in truth, this had more of a sense of place uh, than many of the these games where we actually had a map. But I agree, we didn't really have to track people's locations. They were all close enough that everyone could have gotten everywhere within the reasonable time. And we didn't really need to eliminate someone by time. Like Jonathan uh, or John uh, Olson, maybe he couldn't have gotten somewhere in time, but there was no other reason to suspect him. So we never had to rely on that kind of information. Robert said, I played case one. Without giving anything away, Robert, just give us like a one-liner about whether... No, don't tell us. <laughs> I, never, I changed my mind. Don't tell us anything about whether it's easier, harder, better, or worse. I don't want to know. We should go into it blind. Okay, but assuming that Robert's played case one, he, does, he may not care about watching us play case one. I don't know. Jonathan and Duke. Jonathan says, Wednesday... Duke of Zill, are you available Wednesday? Duke of Zill says, I actually own the Australian version of Case 1 that I haven't played yet, so I'll probably not join you for Case 1 since I plan to play that. I'll be fascinated to see the differences. Okay, so Jonathan and I will figure out when to do it, uh, maybe Wednesday. And then I'll try to do a review. All right, any other final comments about the game, movies, music, anything? Final comments before we end the stream early for us, only six and a half hours. Although usually there's a false ending, but I think this time we're going to end here after our final comments. Art. This was uh, a game set in the art world. Any art to recommend? Any artists to recommend? Jonathan Worth says, I found out Bowie made a concept album about murder mystery, really. Point one outside. Is that the name of the album? That's 
bizarre. Dooku's also they wait for the day when these modern games can harness the narrative control of the old dossier games. Yes. I like the idea of imagine a dossier and then what would you need to combine it with? You really don't the dossier format really has everything you need, but maybe dossier with tighter mystery like this. Robert says, this is the first time I stayed through the end of the stream since I don't have to go to work on Saturdays. I see. So it sounds like Robert might be voting for more weekend streams on Fridays. I think we'll just, we'll keep mixing it up. I do like the 11 p.m.s, even though I know it's not convenient for most people. What about art recommendations? I'm trying to think. I'm a big fan of Art Nouveau, so uh, Alphonse Mucha and um, Maxfield Parish. Not quite Art Nouveau. Hunt a Killer is a standalone mystery called Fine Art Foul Play. Well, I played three of the Hunt a Killer standalone small boxes. And Fine Art Foul Play was not one of them. So either that's new or it's a standalone big set. They've got some big boxes. Jonathan says, I'll have to check it out. Jonathan says, also found a soundtrack for a hypothetical mystery horror film, but came with faux cold case documents, All Hallows 2 by Ogre. Huh, interesting. My local friend group here is going to join me next Saturday to play a murder mystery dinner game. I'm not sure exactly which one we'll play. Have you guys played? Um, <laughs> Duke of Zill says, I've seen the crown jewels in London a few times. They seemed a lot more difficult to steal. Yes, I can imagine. Have any of you played a murder mystery dinner party game before? Do you know this genre? There are a lot of them out there. There are a lot of very mediocre ones, I get the feeling. But some were actually created in like the 60s and 70s, and Alfred Hitchcock did one. They really have this flavor of the old rich people having people over for a fancy dinner and dressing up as roles. Jonathan Warner says, I have once, but it was a long time ago. Basically, they, they're structured differently, but the general idea is they're for a fixed group of people, like maybe from six to eight people or fixed at eight people is the common size, six to eight, some go a little bit higher. And so everyone who's going to attend, they tend to come with an envelope and an and a invitation card, and then you actually fill it out and send it in the mail. That tells the person their role. So you'd pick a story. You know you're going to have eight people. So you give each person a role. You send them their invitation. So it feels like they're getting an invite to a formal event. And when they arrive, they get a little pamphlet, which gives their tells about their character background. And then these games tend to have like some information that they're supposed to reveal when the time comes either at a special time or whenever. And then usually no one, there's usually there's a fixed culprit, but no, no one only in their pamphlet does it tell them they're the culprit. So no one else will know. So then you sit down and you have dinner and you talk as if you're playing each person playing their role. And each person has some information they're trying to convey. And at the very end, you try to you basically like vote who did it. And the one person whose background says they did it knows they did it. Oh, look who's here. Gregory Pravat is here. Um, did it start a long time ago? <laughs> Gregory Pravat is the author of Bureau of Investigation. But uh, yes, Gregory, we're wrapping up. We're all done. Um, so don't look at anything if you ever plan on playing this game. But it's good to see you. We have finished the case. Um, we're just chatting now. So it's good to have you here. 
Hopefully Gregory may join us one of these times when we do a playthrough of Bureau of Investigation when it actually arrives. Right now we're just talking about murder mystery dinner party games and how they work. Robert says, murder mystery uh, party that does the adventure game started out with university. That's right. University Games is one of the big companies that have historically made these murder mystery games. And they make some of the modern mystery suspect games, but they also made some of the very early murder mystery dinner party games of the 70s and 80s. Um, they're not, they tend, the, the dinner murder mystery dinner party games tend not to be really deep uh, mysteries to solve. Some of them come with some extra documents like maps and stuff, but generally you don't want it to be too involved because you're sitting there actually eating dinner and trying to have fun. So, so you're mainly in it for the acting out the roles and the fun. Jonathan Warner says you should make a short video about the experience. Well, let me tell you a little story <laughs> how I almost lost some friends. Um, I have a long history, you probably won't be surprised to hear, of filming stuff, liking to film uh, friends getting together and just hanging out. I used to film in college and high school when we would all hang out. So I have lots of video of us all just hanging out and just talking. I have video of my family. It's very nice to have some time. You know, my father died. It's nice to have video of just him hanging out and chatting with the family so you can remember them. Anyway, so we played this murder mystery uh dinner uh, several years ago and I set up a camera to record it and when the first guests arrive it was about six or seven of my friends I you know mentioned the camera but then the later guests arrive I didn't mention it now it was it was very obvious to me I thought it would be completely clear to anyone who came in that it was being filmed um but it turns out that uh a couple of the people didn't realize it was being filmed and got very upset about that. So I erased it. So it's a good lesson to you. If you are going to film your murder mystery dinner, you better make sure everyone knows it's being filmed. And some people don't want that, don't want to be involved in that. So Gregory says, yes, invite us to play a dinner. I bring the wine plane and <laughs> the plane trips on you. Yeah, it would be hard. <laughs> it would be fun to get a whole bunch of people. But I will say this, here's what you're forgetting. I will be at Gen Con in August. If anyone here is interested in getting together during Gen Con and playing one of these games, murder mystery dinner perhaps, send me a message. Maybe we'll set something up at Gen Con. I have seen them play some of these games. Someone recorded where they have, um, they're not recording the actual dinner, but they have like a room that people go in and give like a confessional, sort of like MTV Real World or something. Like there's a room where you can go in and give your thoughts. So in the middle of the game or in different sessions, each person will file in and say, I suspect this person is up to something, just so they can get on record about it. Any other thoughts, movies, music, art that anyone wants to um, talk about before we end this stream? John says, have you seen the film Until the End of the World? It deals with the theme of video recordings memories. I don't think that I have seen that Until the End of the World. At least I don't remember it. Would you recommend it? Or maybe I'll check that out. Gregory, I'm glad that you um, thought that the playthrough went well. The people here now, Jonathan Warner played Bureau of Investigation with me. I think we had a great time, and I really am looking forward to playing the uh, full game. Gregory, I'd like to hear what, if you've got favorite mystery games that you've played um, or I don't know. I assume you've played some of the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games. Um, do you have any insight? It sounds like Gregory may have seen that movie. 
Gregory, do you have any insight into why the Sherlock Holmes seems to be so popular in French culture? What is it? It's interesting. The Germans have a huge board game culture and a huge mystery game culture. The best of these kinds of games that we play today seem to be German in origin. And the French have a real flavor for these mystery games as well. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. I Maybe it's... Maybe there's no real answer. Any other final sessions? I really wonder, Gregory gave us, since Gregory's here, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask Gregory a couple of questions. Um, someone posted... Um, I, I forget. There's a thread on BDG where where Gregory gives some little estimates for uh, time length of the games, and I know one of them he said two sessions over multiple days. But I'm not sure if that's if Gregory was just telling us like one group, one place tested this. But I'm very curious about how long some of the Bureau of Investigation cases are. All right, and Gregory is talking a little bit about why French culture may be such fans of Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, and those kinds of things. One, book culture. Mm -hmm. There's a company called Cafe Nardos, and Gregory says, the game was translated by Descartes in 1980. This is the company Descartes, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, when in a time when there were few games. Yeah, I really wonder how that happened. I mean, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, originally in 80, 81, when it came out, it was a fairly isolated, like just this little company in San Francisco were making it homemade, but for some so they must have had some arrangement. They must have known someone that it got so quickly translated into French and just took off in France and Paris. I know Descartes, the company that produced it, had a little office or a game shop in Paris. So, yeah, it must have just come at a time when it really took off. That makes sense. It was probably known much more well known in in France than in America. And RPG was a big thing at that time. Interesting. Most of the mystery we're we're alternating things here, but most of the mystery dinner games also come with little suggested recipes and stuff to try to make it fun and suggested outfits that each person wear. John says, one more movie thing I mentioned a couple of times, but there is a film Cure in 1997. I saw in a forum someone saw the high and low influence. Really? Okay. High and low, one of my favorite movies I recommend every time we're on this uh, stream. Cure is some influence of high and low. Okay, I'll check it out. Gregory says, Descartes' shop is the iceberg tip of Jou... Descartes, actually, Jules Descartes is the owner of Space Cowboy, and Asmodee owned Jules Descartes. Well, that's interesting. The only reason I know Jules Descartes is because when we played Adventures by Gaslight, which was written by a French couple and was an amazing experience, that's you see it behind me right there in the yellow box, that Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, Detective Expansion. Jonathan Warner and I played on the channel. It took us 45 hours. We wrote a 45-page PDF patch afterwards, and we exchanged hundreds of emails about it. It was an amazing, epic experience. was written by a French couple. I can't remember their name at the moment, and translated back into English. And the only thing I remember, I remember Jus Descartes was the company and the shop that published it and ran a competition. I don't know if you know about this, Gregory, is that um, originally Adventures by Gaslight was a competition. The answers weren't provided when you bought the game, but you could go to Jus Descartes store in Paris 
give them your coupon from the game and get the solution a month later after the end of the competition. And Gregory says he signed Bureau of Investigation with Jude Descartes. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh -huh. I didn't I didn't know the history of his story. We were talking about Yastari, or however you pronounced it, were the was the company that did the first major reprint of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. And I don't know what happened to them, but it would make sense if they were bought or absorbed by Space Cowboys, how that happened, how Space Cowboys came to reprint it in an even more elaborate, fancy production. Gregory would have been the perfect person to ask about Adventures by Gaslight translation things. There were a couple things in Adventures by Gaslight, originally written in French, and the French version was called The Paper Birds. I forget the French term for it. Different name. It was translated very well, um, but there were a couple of moments where we wondered about the French translation, the original. Um, so we were trying to find someone with a French version to answer some questions, but it might have been nice to... But we, we since we never found a French version, that wouldn't have helped. <laughs> the companies are on Bureau of Investigation, SHCD, DC, and France is a case by itself. It will be nice to have Gregory on and chat after we play through all of the games in Bureau of Investigation. It will be nice to have Gregory on and talk about some of those cases and our experiences. I know that it's got to be, uh, you write these games, you can't play them yourself. So it, it would be fun to be able to talk about them, what worked, what didn't, favorite moments. So hopefully after we play them, we'll have a chance to talk about them. Gaslight was pretty amazing, Adventures by Gaslight. But it could be very frustrating, but we had fun with it. Final comments before we end the stream. Overall review, though, without saying anything more, I would absolutely recommend this case, the Hidden Games Crime Scenes series. Case two, very good, not the hardest, not quite as good at an adventure set, not quite as good as the, as the adventure set, but adventure set might be a little bit for an advanced player. Um, this would be a great case as a first case. Jonathan says, has anyone taken a crack at Kane's jawbone yet? Not me. I have it. I haven't taken a crack at it. Um, Gregory says, you asked something about two sessions when I was writing. Gregory, I was just talking about, you wrote a reply on BGG, something about how long the different cases take, how long they are. And you were saying, you were giving estimates of time. And then one of them, you gave an estimate of like two sessions, a couple hours each session. And so maybe you were talking about, here's one play group that took, that did it over two sessions. I don't know if you were saying like, you're not going to be able to finish this in one session, etc. cetera. Cat Robert says, Cafe Nordos Mysteries are called Nordos Room Services, designed for couples as a date night. I think you may have pointed this out to me at some point. I think that's a great idea. I think I may have, either you may have pointed that out or I saw one on Amazon. Um, that's very appealing, a two-person date night mystery game. I think that's a great idea. Gregory Privat says, cases three and four may be very long to play. That's music to my ears. The longer, the better.
All right. Let's wrap it up before we exhaust Gregory. I had great fun. All right, I'm going to switch off your comments here. I'll switch them back on at the very end. This was very fun. Highly recommended. We'll be playing... We'll go back and play case one of this series. There are only two American localized games in the series so far. We'll play case one next week, and then I'll do a spoiler-free review of the set. Thanks to Jonathan, Robert, Duke of Zill, and Gregory for stopping by. We'll go one last switch over here, a little teaser from Gregory. Case three is actually often very long. That's great. We take our time. This game says you should be able to play it in one to two hours, and we took six hours, so that gives you some idea. John says, I guess one more thing people can think about and maybe get back to next time in post-game discussion. What is your favorite social deduction video game? Social deduction video game or tabletop game or tabletop game. All right, folks. Let's end it there. I'll see you next time, next week, or in the next review. Mm -hmm.